the meeting's now live. Thank you very much, Emily. Right. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Communities Overview Committee. I'm Councillor Cecilia Motley, Chair of the Committee. I'm obliged to inform you that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Members of the public will be able to hear the audio of the meeting and view the papers shown on the screen. This meeting is being held using remote technology and should any committee member experience technical difficulties during the meeting, they should immediately contact the designated IT officer on the number they've already been supplied with. Everyone is requested to mute their microphones unless asked to speak. Please only use the chat function to indicate the desire to speak. Do not use it for anything else so that it is clear who is asking to talk. The debate has to be heard by those listening to the audio feed. As chair, I will interpret the council's existing standing orders in light of the requirements of remote participation with advice from the monitoring officer prior to making a ruling. I will ask members of the committee to confirm their presence and any disclosable pecuniary interest they have in any of the items on the agenda. I will ask everyone that speaks during the meeting, including members of the committee and officers to introduce themselves each time they speak. This is so those listening know who is speaking. I shall now turn to the items on the agenda. Number one, apologies. Can the committee officer confirm if there are any apologies and substitutions? It's Emily Marshall, committee officer. Uh, there are no apologies. Thank you. Uh, number two, roll call and disclosable pecuniary interests. Members are reminded to disclose any pecuniary interest in any matters to be discussed, which is not included in the register of interests and leave the meeting prior to the matter being discussed. I will now read out each member's name and ask them to confirm the present, their presence and confirm if there are any interests. Um, I am Cecilia Motley, chair of this meeting. Nick Hignett. Yeah, present chair and no pecuniary interests. Thank you. Claire Aspinall. I think not present. Ted Clark. Uh, present and no interests. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Nigel Hartin. Uh, present chair and uh, no pecuniary interest to declare. Roger Hughes. Present, no interest. Viv Parry. Present and no pecuniary interest. Keith Roberts. Present, no pecuniary interest. Leslie Winwood. Present, no pecuniary interests. Tina Woodward. Chair, present and no pecuniary interests. Thank you all very much indeed. We now move on to item number three, minutes. I move that the minutes of the Communities Overview Committee meeting held on the 8th of December 2020, as circulated, be signed as a correct record. Could I have a seconder, please? Keith Roberts, I'll second them, Chair. Thank you very much. I will now accept these minutes as a true record unless anyone else indicates differently. Everybody happy? Yes. Fine, thanks very much. Number four, public question time. Uh, no public questions have been received. Uh, number five, member question time. And no member questions have been received. Now we move on to the first item, uh, substantive item on the agenda, climate change draft action plan and quantified carbon budget. Um, we're lucky to have Adrian Cooper, the Planning Policy and Strategy Manager. I'm not quite sure whether that's what he calls himself anymore. Adrian, is it? Uh, no, Chair. Actually, I'm now the uh, Climate Change Task Force Manager. I thought so. I do apologise. Um, could you possibly introduce yourself and present this item, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm Adrian Cooper. I'm the Climate Change Task Force Manager. Um, Members, you've had a report which uh, uh, is uh, sets out basically uh, the, the, the main structure and, and uh, introduces climate change as a consideration together with uh, an overview of the action plan which the council adopted uh, in December of last year. And um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time 
uh, necessarily on the report itself. That's there for you to be able to read um, should you wish to. Uh, but I do think there's some things that we could helpfully uh, use as an introduction as a starting point, which I'm just going to run through for you before we can then open up uh, for questions through the chair. So if everybody's happy with that, I'll, I'll press on. Uh, so the report you've got uh, is, is an overview. Um, it gives an indication of um, the significance of climate change as a consideration to the council and to the county as a whole. The strategy and action plan which the council adopted in December is one which is for Shropshire Council as an organisation. It's a corporate uh, document, a corporate strategy, looking at the council's own performance and how it can uh, act to reduce its own carbon footprint moving forward. Um, we have an adopted objective of achieving a net zero carbon performance by 2030, which is a relatively short time frame. This is an ambitious strategy. Uh, and a lot of work is going to be needed to actually implement it. The action plan which accompanied that strategy then sets out uh, two main things. There's a, a pipeline of active projects, things which are in active development uh, or, or being brought forward right now uh, to help us with our performance uh, on a range of different topics. And we'll perhaps dig into those in a little bit more detail shortly. And it also contains a wider uh, a list, a longer list of, of potential interventions and actions which we might take moving forward over the period to 2030 in order to help improve our performance. So there's more detail about the pipeline projects than there is about the others, necessarily because these are things which are, are in a more advanced state of development, basically. Um, in terms of uh, the significance of those things, they, they, they come right across the full range of different council services and right across the different parts of Shropshire Council's uh, footprint. Um, it's worth noting just for a minute that, uh, like many organisations, the, the council's carbon footprint uh, is actually largely derived from what it buys in and commissions, what it procures. Its direct carbon footprint is relatively modest by comparison, not to say it's not significant. Um, so the stuff that we ourselves directly control is a smaller part, uh, uh, plays a smaller part, makes a smaller contribution to our current performance. Um, and so uh, there's a, a job of work to do to look at that, working with companies from whom we uh, acquire services and facilities and, and goods. So, um, in broad terms, there's some graphs and, and, uh, and performance data set out in that report, but I'm not going to go into huge detail uh, on that. I'm happy to pick up questions if there are some later about that. It's worth then, I think, moving to look at the Council's uh, response to climate change as uh, an agenda item. Uh, what resources have we put in play? How are we applying those resources and so on? And so you will rem remember, I'm sure, uh, members, that, uh, that the council declared a, a climate emergency back in May of 19. And uh, I was then appointed, uh, moving from my substantive post as uh, uh, planning policy uh, uh, manager to take up the mantle of the uh, newly created climate task force and, and run with that in uh, round about November of, of 19. And we were successful in managing to put together a what we termed a framework at that time, uh, which was adopted by Council in December of 2019. And that set out in a, in a sort of route map effectively towards a full strategy and action plan. And that full strategy and action plan were then uh, brought back to members, back to full Council uh, in December of 20. So uh, the main part of our uh, activity during that 12 month period, in addition to, to writing that strategy and developing that action plan, has been really around embedding climate change as a consideration. Uh, this needs to be something which is adopted uh, as a principle right the way across the organisation. Um, it is good to have a task force around which the efforts can be focused, but a relatively modest number of staff would never be able to take on 
uh, an entire council's uh, uh, efforts in terms of tackling climate change on their own. And it's essential um, that you have a, a nexus around which um, you can uh, uh, apply a much wider uh, influence across an organisation. And that is what we've been focused on. And members will be aware, for example, that um, there is now a, a requirement built into um, uh, the committee uh, process whereby committee papers, committee reports need to have uh, a climate appraisal as an integral part of their structure to help inform this and demonstrate that it's a consideration that's been uh, considered as part of whatever is uh, being decided. So that's been early effort. We've also been working uh, then to work up specific uh, projects and actions, and they are the things which are set out in that uh, action plan pipeline of projects. Um, and the expectation is that we will continue working on that pipeline of projects and, and work our way through uh, some particular uh, things as we as we move through the year and in subsequent years. So I think that that probably gives you a fair idea of, of where where we've been and to some extent headlines about where we're going. And I'll dig into a bit more detail about that later. There is another aspect, which is how then does Shropshire Council and its own corporate efforts uh, fit in with the wider effort of uh, achieving a net zero carbon performance or reducing carbon emissions across the county as a whole? And uh, in that regard, we're, we're very fortunate to have um, a new organisation which uh, we have helped create, be fostered, uh, um, and played an active role in the creation of the community-led Shropshire Climate Action Partnership, which is launching its own uh, uh, strategy and action plan for the county as a whole today. And uh, we have ourselves put out a uh, um, press uh, release uh, to help support that uh, launch today, and uh, we will continue to support them in their efforts. And it is that organisation which we uh, have given the acronym SCAP, Shropshire Climate Action Partnership SCAP, which um, is leading the charge in terms of wider performance. Um, we need to work very closely with SCAP, uh, and we have done already, we will continue to do so, and use our good offices as an organisation to uh, help uh, achieve that wider benefit. It is worth noting that Shropshire Council's own corporate carbon footprint is around about only 1% of that of Shropshire. So our direct influence over performance is relatively modest, but our indirect influence is much greater through our regulatory roles. And I think particularly through procurement, um, we can it seek to influence a much wider uh, range of carbon performance in the county as a whole. And uh, we will certainly be looking to do that over the coming years. So SCAP launching today, and uh, um, I would certainly recommend to you that you have a look at the press on that and have a look at their strategy and a look at the implications for that. So um, in terms of, of the sorts of things that the council is going to focus on over the coming year within that pipeline, I think they break down into a number of distinct areas. Uh, there is one around energy efficiency, our strategy, after all, is, is divided into three basic sections, powering down, using less energy, producing less carbon as a result of that, uh, generating efficiency gains and saving money at the same time. Uh, but then uh, generating renewable energy as the second order of business. Uh, happily, uh, we're in a position where we can use our land and our buildings to uh, put in solar generation, for example, and both save the council uh, carbon emissions and save its money. Um, we can invest in uh, solar generation as a, a, a proposition, which also helps to reduce our emissions uh, as well as generating a revenue stream. So there's some co-benefits there which are really very valuable. And the third aspect then is really around compensating for what remains. We must reduce our footprint uh, to the least we can, as quickly as we can, and then uh, uh, we will end up, there will always be a residual element and it will be how we then offset that uh, by land management activity largely. This can be tree planting, but tree planting is not the only answer, it is not a panacea. You need a range of other different land management activities 
uh, particularly to do with soils um, and uh, um, particularly uh, wetland management, um, which will be important aspects as well. Uh, and so you will find within the action plan there are all of those elements, as well as uh, organisation focused activities like staff training and, and so on. OK, I think that um, rather than me uh, going on for a long time, I'd be very happy, uh, Chair, to, to stop there and take questions unless you'd like me to continue on any particular aspect. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, <coughs> to be quite honest with you, <coughs> this is such a giant um, subject, isn't it? That I think um, if we tried to tackle it all, we'd probably be here for a week. Um, but I'm very, I'm particularly interested in some of some of the uh, things that you've just told us just in that short introduction. And um, I wonder, the, 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 I think there are two issues that I'd just like some clarification on. When you talk about procurement um, as a way of bringing down our carbon footprint, um, this is obviously, a, this, this may be a council process, procurement, but it affects the entire country, doesn't it? Um, and what I'm really quite interested uh, about here is those things which are, are for example, somewhat outside our control, um, because I'm just thinking, for example, in the middle of the COVID epidemic, we've got uh, vans, particularly, you know, delivery vans, zooming all around the county, all of them diesel, all of them pumping out um, noxious fumes. And it, it, this is not something that we can control. So I just I just wonder whether you've had any thoughts about how, not only how we can we can make sure that our procurement processes and the result of our uh, procurement processes are as carbon friendly, carbon neutral as as possible and how you think we could go about that. But also what we do about those who come into the county, um, who, you know, who are quite legitimately uh, uh, delivering services, but who don't fall under our procurement uh, 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 processes. Sorry, it's, that, it's a bit of a mean question to start you off on, really. Not at all, thank you. Uh, so um, just to reintroduce myself as Adrian Cooper, Climate Change uh, Task Force Manager. OK, um, in terms of procurement specifically, then uh, just to put it in context, um, Shropshire Council's carbon footprint uh, in the most recent year that we could measure, which was 2018, was approximately 51 and a half thousand tonnes of carbon. Now, of that, only about 5000 tonnes is actually generated from direct the direct operation of our buildings, uh, including the electricity that we buy in and uh, things like heat and power and travel on, on council business. So approximately 46,000 tonnes is being generated uh, from activity or, or, or services and goods which we buy in. And that's on the basis of how much we spend on those activities. And, and you, if you dig into this a little bit more, you will find that the biggest parts of that procurement footprint derive from, unsurprisingly, uh, from the things that we spend most money on. So social care services, which involve a great deal of mileage, for example. Um, uh, highway maintenance activity, which by its very nature uh, can be quite carbon hungry. And things like building maintenance, as opposed to the day to day operation of buildings, Building maintenance activity uh, is also a significant source of carbon. And so those are all things where we can start to work with suppliers. Uh, we can amend our procurement policies to flag up to suppliers that going forward, these are considerations which will be an important part of the appointment process, the tendering process and the tender assessment process. That, I suspect, will be a gradation where we might start by saying, well, we need to know for the purposes of calculating our own carbon impact as an organisation, we need to know how much carbon you will be emitting uh, in carrying out that service for us or 
in uh, supplying whatever goods it might happen to be to us. We need to know what the carbon footprint of that activity or that those goods is. That's the first point. I suspect strongly then within a relatively short period of time, the next ask will be, OK, well, we understand how much you're going to be putting out uh, as a result of what we've asked you to do or to supply. How are you going to reduce that? We want an active plan, something focused on our specific circumstances that shows us what it is you are going to do as a supplier to reduce that carbon footprint. And I think that the end game here, and I suspect will happen in fairly short order, will be uh, that if you don't engage with this and you can't show us what the carbon impact of what you're doing is or will be, and you're not proposing to put in place any measures or controls to mitigate that, we will not employ you. Simple as that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you could reasonably expect to see that uh, in, a, in a small number of years rolled out not only uh, by ourselves as a, as a, a, you know, somebody procuring goods and services, but probably by all large corporate business in whatever mm -hmm. sector, public sector or not. <coughs> And we already see this to some extent with the social value agenda where this is happening. Uh, government has, is just about to introduce a change which will significantly increase uh, social value as a consideration in procurement. And climate change is an integral part of the same agenda, I would suggest. Um, social value is going to become far more important. It won't just be, uh, possibly not even in the majority, about value for money. Value for money is a wider agenda that, that may extend to encompassing climate change as well. Sorry, that was a bit of a long winded response. Uh, picking up on the point you made specifically, Chair, about uh, uh, delivery vehicles, um, there are some really interesting trends in here. And uh, I should stress that um, we are all on a learning curve. Things are changing very quickly in, in this area of work. Um, have to be quite agile in keeping up with good practice and, and the level of evidence and information that's available. Um, and so what we're finding generally uh, is that the fact that there's far less car traffic, private domestic car traffic, may mean that in overall terms, uh, uh, deliveries using a van are actually more efficient and therefore relatively less carbon is being produced as a result. But equally, I think we could just roll back to the previous item on, on procurement and corporate behaviour on climate change. And it is notable, for example, that Amazon, that well-known paragon of, uh, of delivery, um, has just ordered, I think, 150,000 electric delivery vehicles. I think this gives you an indication of the direction of travel, that, that increasingly we will start to see um, big corporate firms uh, with a, a strong ethic uh, actually looking to their own footprint, looking to the footprint of their own suppliers and starting to take uh, uh, investment decisions and steps to actively manage and mitigate their own carbon footprint, including through transport. Thank you. I'm very grateful to you for that reply. And I should actually, I've broken all the rules because I should have introduced myself in the first instance by saying that I'm uh, Cecilia Motley, chair of the meeting, uh, before I started bombarding you. Um, and so I apologise to everybody for uh, that mistake. Um, one, one thing that I would like to know, I mean, I can see it, how effective a, a, a very um, uh, plain and obvious and, and, and well put out and well understood procurement process would be. Um, have you managed to put a toe into the water as yet uh, in terms of procurement and in terms of trying to bring this change about? Thank you, Chair. Yes, so uh, Adrian Cooper, Climate Change Task Force Manager. Um, uh, we are working with colleagues in, in the Council's procurement service um, and there is an active uh, uh, effort going on in terms of social value changes to our procurement strategy and uh, so we're actively contributing to that in order to ensure that climate change is captured as a part of that agenda and so i think it would be reasonable to expect uh, when we have a new procurement strategy being drafted and put out um, then it will reflect this agenda explicitly 
Thank you. Um, now I'm looking at my chat function, which seems to be distressingly um, empty at the moment. I do hope that members of the committee will populate that because I'd like to see loads of questions. But until somebody Chair. does, I'm going to. Chair, uh, if I may. Yeah. Um, there are, uh, I've got questions here from uh, uh, Dean Carroll, Nigel Hart, and Vivian Parry, and Tina Woodward have all asked to speak. Excellent. Well, um, I just wonder why it didn't come up in the chat function. Oh, sorry about that. No, they're, they're, they're sorry. If, if, if you're having a difficulty there, I'm happy to read them out for you. I think the first person to ask was uh, was uh, was uh, Dean Carroll. Excellent. Dean Dean Carroll, uh, um, uh, a very warm welcome. Thank please, you very uh, much, please yeah. speak. Councillor Dean Carroll, I'm the portfolio holder for Adult Social Care, Public Health and Climate Change. Um, Adrian has given an enormously um, detailed uh, introduction to this paper as befits his um, role as a doyen now of our climate action work at Shropshire Council. Um, there's, there are some things though that I would like to add to what Adrian has said, focusing specifically on some of the ambitions and drawing your attention to a couple of those in terms of being climate being carbon neutral by 2030 which was the first ambition we set which as Adrian has said will be ambitious but we believe and expect to be achievable and in terms of how we get there as a little bit of reassurance for you as a scrutiny committee our approach and our intention is to go as fast as we possibly can through this process to front load as much of the reductions as we can. We're not waiting around for the last three or four years in order to reach carbon neutrality at 2030. We're starting now because it's actually going to be it's going to be an enormous piece of work. But the more low hanging fruit that we can capture now by improving the efficiency of our buildings and some of those such as leisure centres, um, libraries, for example, particularly energy inefficient because of either the ages of them or by virtue of what they do as a building and their design. If we can start by targeting some of those alongside generating significant amounts of renewable energy, and there is one in the action plan, which is just the first site that we're furthest along with, um, in Oswald Street, Maysbury Road, which which we've identified as having the ability to generate two megawatts. I say we, but actually we've brought in external expertise um, and have identified this as having the potential to generate two megawatts. To give you some idea, to, to give you some idea, um, I believe Adrian will correct me if I've got the numbers wrong on this. But I believe that was enough for around 1500 homes, was it Adrian? Sounds about right, yes. Yeah, so that's the first of many hopefully projects. We've identified a pipeline, some of them immediately deliverable, some of them a few years off, that will carry us into the tens of megawatts. And that's just in solar generation. We're also looking at hydroelectric opportunities as well. And something I'm very keen at is hydrogen fuel. Adrian's spoken about the electric vehicle element, but some but a few things we know actually. Firstly, large vehicles, buses, refuse lorries, fire engines, all kinds of large trucks. The weight of the batteries in electric vehicles are prohibitive to making those a practical, um, a practical alternative to diesel. Something else we know in a large rural county like Shropshire, the mileage required to be covered by buses and refuse vehicles, for example, in the course of their daily journeys is prohibitive to efficient use of electric vehicles. A third thing we know, if everybody who owns a car or van or lorry or bus immediately converted them to electric vehicles across the country today and plugged them in at five o'clock, 
the national grid will collapse. So electric vehicles can't be the only answer to decarbonizing transport. And that's why we're looking, we're more than looking actually, we're deep into uh, the opportunities presented by hydrogen fuel. Hydrogen fuel is something that I know there was a company in South Shropshire a few years ago looking at hydrogen powered cars that have since just migrated over the border into Wales, but we'd very much like to talk to them. We're talking to regional, national, multinational companies and universities about the opportunities hydrogen presents, particularly in a place like Shropshire, because it's not just about refueling the vehicles, it's also how do you produce the energy? How do you produce the fuel for vehicles, for buildings? How do you produce that fuel? If we can produce that internally to Shropshire, that A, gives us savings, cost savings, B, generates an income, C, it reduces the carbon that we emit, D, it provides us with energy and fuel security in an increasingly unstable world. So that brings me on to the second ambition that, that we're, that I announced in December for Council, which is not only to be carbon neutral, but for the council to be energy self-sufficient, which would make us the first council in the UK to become energy self-sufficient by 2030. That means in layman's terms, generating the power we need to power our buildings, generating the power for our scope three emissions, taking the procurement route as Adrian has described to, to bottom out the carbon emissions coming through scope three, which is the non-direct emissions, and also by generating our own vehicle fuels, whether that's for hydrogen fuel or generating the electricity for electric vehicles, because I think it will be a mix. But that gives us a really exciting opportunity. And the third thing briefly on ambitions, um, in the action plan, it identifies 2050 as the date to by which we will be aiming to plant 345,000 trees. As of last uh, full, cap, full council in December, we took a very close look at that, what we'd done to date and decided that 2050 wasn't ambitious enough, but 2030 for that was equally achievable, which would require as opposed to the 11,000 trees being planted a year that the original target was, it would require around 32,000 trees a year to be planted, which is a target we hit in the first year, or we've hit in the first year already. So those are all ambitious but achievable objectives, and that of course ties in partly to the carbon sequestration, which is part of the main carbon action plan. I, I would maybe like to suggest to um, to scrutiny that I, I I mean I never look to to direct scrutiny or, or 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 influence you but perhaps I would I know I and officers would always welcome the opportunity to work with task and finish groups if you saw the value in that and the action plan as I described it, as I have described it at every point at which I've introduced it, is a living working document and we want people to be coming up with ideas to contribute to it. We want it, it's in adult social care we use, which is another part of my portfolio, we use the term co-production uh, co where we genuinely look to produce things together, which is what we're looking for, which is what we're hoping that the Shropshire Climate Action Partnership will be doing and is doing. And so I make this genuine offer that I would hope that there would be some way that scrutiny would not just have oversight of our work, but also maybe would like to take a role in inputting into that as we go forward. I think I've probably said enough, Chair, but I may wish to come in alongside Adrian in answers to questions, depending on what they are. But thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you very much, Dean. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Um, and it's very interesting uh, to hear uh, your ambitions. Um, 
And I have to say that I'm sure that uh, this scrutiny committee would wish to have some involvement in the work that you're doing, that if, if they're probably not necessarily through a, a task and finish group, unless there was some very, very specific issue which, which demanded it. Um, we have found over the past four years that um, if you if we overdo the task and finish groups, we tend not to achieve as much as we would like to. So we're looking for new working models, actually, to see how we can take discrete pieces of work, work, you know, have a really good thrash at them and and um, and then represent them. So um, we but I, I think the, the principle of, of of continuing to work with you on this is is absolutely fine and embedded. So um, we would hope in any case that as this is such a fast moving scene that you would be coming back and updating us and, and, and bouncing ideas off us, um, you know, uh, in the future. Um, now, I'm aware that I've got a big long list and I can't see who they are. So, Daniel, could we have the next speaker? Thank you so much for that, uh, Dean. Uh, the next person is uh, Councillor Nigel Hartin. Nigel. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Nigel Hartin, uh, Clundervision. Uh, th thank you to uh, Dean as portfolio. That was uh, that was a very interesting um, uh, wh whiz through some of the things that are going on at the moment. So thank you very much for that. Very interesting and useful, I think. Um, I want to come back to something you touched on a, li a little earlier when you started out in relation to the way that we operate within our buildings and so on. As a council, we're now looking forward in the next two or three or four years um, and, and, and so on for um, for moving away from the current way we do we deliver the service if you like of what we do as a council away from the, the building in the shire hall and, and and moving towards a more virtual way of doing things in the move to the pride hill center and so on but I'm, I'm interested in in the way that perhaps um, we look at climate change not only in the way that we deal with buildings we're moving to uh, for instance the pride hill center but also the sites that we leave behind uh, for instance that that shire hall and how i didn't see in the paper that we we looked at recently um, um in terms of but putting forward the, the change um, away from the Shire Hall. I didn't see much in that in, in terms of the way that the climate change um, actions are, are going to be fed into uh, the, 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 the moves that are going on in the next two or three years. So I wonder if either Dean or, or, or Adrian could perhaps uh, help with that. Um, either yeah. of you. Um, I, I would just, before you get going, Dean, I would just point out that um, this is obviously something that needs thinking about, and uh, uh, um, Nigel, um, uh, I suspect that there are quite a lot of decisions to be taken, um, of which this will be an integral part. But anyway, I don't want to steal Dean's thunder or indeed Adrian's thunder on this one. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Dean Carroll again. Yes, Nigel, I mean, Carbon reduction and climate action will be an integral part of everything the council does moving forward. It has to be in order to reach our objectives. And that's been the approach we've taken since day one. It would be very easy to label a nice big team as climate change and say, right, everything is done by them and parcel them away somewhere at the end of a corridor and let them get on with it. That's not what we've done. We've got a small core team, a cadre of, of um, experts in the fields in the task force under Adrian. And the idea is that it embeds carbon reduction in everything that Shropshire Council does. It's, it's a green thread that underpins the whole tapestry of Shropshire Council's operations, as I think Adrian did touch on right back at the start. In terms of Shire Hall, I mean, those are all decisions that are still yet to be made. However, I can assure you that carbon reduction and climate change will be a um, uh, at the forefront of all of our minds when it comes to making actual technical decisions about that. But as the chair has pointed out, I think it's a little bit too early to be going into any level of detail about what that might look like, but I can give assurance to scrutiny that it would be something that would be forefront of all of our minds. I don't know whether Adrian wants to add anything to that. Thank you, Dean. Yes, if I may. So Adrian Cooper, Climate Change Task Force Manager. 
Um, yes, I'm very interesting on these these two points specifically. Um, it's probably just worth uh, uh, reinforcing what Dean has said in terms of remote working, particularly. This has been very interesting, and we're not alone as being a large organisation uh, whose staff are now largely uh, going to be working from home moving forward. And we were very interested to dig into the carbon implications of that. Um, because obviously, on the one hand, you've got a lot of people not travelling uh, as much as they were. Um, and on the other hand, you've got a lot of people potentially heating houses that weren't heated before. Um, and what we found on the basis of the modelling that we've completed so far, and I, I wouldn't claim that it's absolutely uh, uh, definitive, but, but all the indications are thus far that actually this represents a significant carbon saving for the council's footprint. Bear in mind, please, that Shropshire Council as an employer is responsible in, in carbon uh, measurement terms for both its staff commuting and for any home heating during which time those homes are being used as a workplace. So this is part of our scope three indirect emissions, actually, uh, and it's therefore quite a significant. It's not a huge uh, saving, but it is interesting that it's a saving. Uh, and uh, certainly in terms of accommodation then, uh, uh, what accommodation uh, pattern we end up with moving forward uh, will be different obviously to, to what we have had. Uh, and certainly um, I, can, I can certainly corroborate uh, D Dean Carroll's view that um, that is a consideration which is already hardwired into the consideration that's being given to the options before us, including anything at Pride Hill and indeed the redevelopment of any of our existing sites. And of course, increasingly national policy will kick in here as well. So uh, members of, of the scrutiny committee may not be aware, but uh, the government has actually just published its response to the future home standard. So this is building regulations, uh, um, but they've now come back with detailed proposals and transition arrangements, which will take us to a position where, for example, new domestic property, new housing, will have to be built to a certain minimum standard by 2023 with transitional arrangements in between now and then. And in such a way that that new build housing will not need substantial retrofit work in order to comply with a net zero performance. Now that's quite significant. And of course it will affect uh, anything that we might sell or develop ourselves as a council uh, moving forward as well. OK, th thank you very much. I think that was very, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dean and Adrian. Uh, can we move on to the next uh, the next question, please, Daniel? Thank you. It's uh, Councillor Vivian Parry. Uh, Vivian? Hello, Vivian Parry. Uh, I'm the Shropshire Councillor for Ludlow South. I've been asked by conservation groups. Thank you very much for all that interesting information, by the way. Um, it really has helped. I've been asked by uh, conservation groups if how many council properties have we that have been uh, had solar panels and underground heating as yet and how much is this all going to cost when we decide where we're going to be as a council is it going to be very expensive to do this because a lot of people are telling me uh, they don't know any of those things nothing they've not seen any lists of how much it's going to cost or anything uh, but they want to know if it's going to be brought up to standard. Will the government be finding grants for councils to put in underground heating? Because they've found that if you put it into housing, it's very expensive. So could I have a couple of questions, answers on my little bits of questions, please? Uh, I know really you can't give me maybe straight away, but I would like to have that because I'm being asked that by quite a few people. Thank you, Viv. Um, uh, Adrian stroke Dean, whichever one of you or both of you. Shall I take that, Dean? Yeah, if you want to handle the technical aspects. Can um, I just clarify um, from Councillor Parry, did you um, did you mean ground sourced heat pumps? That's right, right ground okay. sourced heat pumps, sorry. I didn't okay. say as I should do, I'm sorry, I don't sometimes. I scoot okay. over some of the words. I will defer to Adrian for the technical details. Right, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So Adrian Cooper, Climate Change Task Force Manager. 
Yes, OK, so in terms of council properties, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, there is an active programme of, of work to invest in energy efficiency measures in, in properties across the council's estate. Um, all geographies, um, so pretty well every market town in which we operate buildings uh, has at least one or more buildings in the programme uh, that we are, are looking to implement. Um, and the sorts of improvements we're talking about uh, are all sorts of things, obviously insulation, windows and doors and physical insulation of the fabric, uh, control systems, uh, uh, efficient use of lighting and heating is partly a product of, of um, uh, control systems and, and you can update those. In terms of the source of heating, and heating is probably the biggest energy user of all, Absolutely, there are a range of properties which already have uh, heat pumps fitted, not always ground source heat pumps. Mm. And, and part of the reason for that is that uh, ground source heat pumps particularly are quite expensive to fit in capital terms because you need to drill uh, either deep boreholes or, or dig trenches uh, for a kind of a, a heat loop, basically, which means you need quite a large external area to, to fit it to. But we do have a lot of heat pumps, air source heat pumps, which, which work on the kind of differential air temperatures uh, to, to strip uh, heat out of, out of the ambient air and actually feed it into the building as heating. And we do have a lot of um, uh, solar power arrays on, on our buildings. Uh, both our buildings and indeed quite a few school buildings have solar arrays fitted. Shire Hall is, is the biggest single array that we have. Um, but there are also a range of other ones uh, in, in schools and other buildings across the county. Um, and taken together, I think we have around about 40 uh, to give you an indication. So this is not uh, just one or two, it's, it's quite a large number. Um, and so that work will continue. Part of the, the pipeline of projects that you, you've got is, is dealing with that. Um, and we have uh, an active program and we've just applied for some government funding to support uh, improvements to some additional buildings in Oswestry and Bridge North uh, and where else, Blimey, uh, I think there's one more in Shrewsbury. Um, but we have looked at- There was one in Market Drayton as well, wasn't there? There was one in Market Drayton, thank you, uh, Dean, yes. Uh, so a whole range of buildings and that's just a single phase. In terms of the funding, government grants, yes, there are a range of government grants. Uh, the government had a, a big push on this in the last kind of six to 12 months and uh, offered up a whole series of uh, what they termed public sector decarbonisation scheme grants. It's always a mouthful. <laughs> um, we did apply. Um, we haven't at the moment uh, had an indication that we've received any funding from that. We know that the funds were heavily oversubscribed, notwithstanding the fact that the government was making available one billion pounds. So it gives you an indication of the scale of, of investment that's required. But we will continue to apply for that funding. In terms of, of how we uh, manage the cost of this, obviously it helps enormously if we can access government grants. Um, but even if we can't, uh, many of the improvements we're talking about will actually save significant amounts of revenue cost. So if, we, if we're in a position where we can invest in the fabric of a building or we can invest in a new heating system or a control system that significantly reduces how much power or heat we're using, there is a return, there is a payback on that, which very often will mean the thing is, is cost effective to carry out anyway, even without any grant money. Thank, thank you very much, Adrian. That's, that's extremely helpful. Could I just ask, um, just just thinking about um, ways of of uh, heating houses in particular. Uh, way back in the days of South Shropshire District Council, we had an anaerobic digester in Ludlow, which fed the whole of an estate across the road through underground pipes, taking the um, the heat to to it. Um, I've no idea what's happened to that now. But um, although anaerobic digestion is probably rather old school these days, um, are there, there must be quite a lot of schemes around, are there not, which use that, that kind of, of, of um, methodology of feeding um, heat 
via either anaerobic digestion or obviously solar panels, we know about those, um, um, straight into, into uh, houses rather than going into the grid and then out again somewhere else. Celia, it's just gone up for sale. Ah, has it? Thank you, yes. Beth. Those were the days. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, Adrian Cooper, Task Force, uh, Climate Task Force Manager. So, uh, yes, in terms of, of, of heat networks, particularly, um, you obviously, it's something which lends itself very well to a kind of denser urban situation. So, for example, there is a heat network in central Birmingham, um, as you might expect, the, the hospitals and, and large buildings which, which can use that and share the heat from a number of different sources around between buildings. Um, we are uh, actively working on a scheme to try to use the heat from the battlefield energy recovery plant in this way. OK, so we have applied for government funding uh, to carry out a study which will explore yep. whether we can supply heat from that plant uh, across uh, to adjacent uses on the industrial estate within which it sits. And uh, hopefully we're waiting on an outcome in terms of whether we've received that funding, but we're, we're very hopeful that we will. In terms of power, that is that is another one. Um, and what's really interesting here is uh, uh, Councillor Dean Carroll um, mentioned earlier that the constraints that apply to the uh, national infrastructure, the national grid in terms of the distribution of, of electricity for, for recharging in that, in that instance. But it applies more widely. And one of the issues with uh, generating power from renewable sources is very often the cost of achieving a, a, a connection to the national grid. Yeah. To put this in context for you, the scheme which we're looking at, which which uh, Councillor Carroll mentioned in, in Oswald Street at Maysbury Road, is a former landfill site which sits within the middle of an industrial estate. And uh, there's a, a, an area of, of woodland, but on the top, the flat top of the, the site is, is free of trees and, and would accommodate uh, around about four uh, acres of um, solar panels. OK, now for us to connect that to the national grid would cost in the order of a million pounds. Which would probably uh, make it unviable in, in financial terms. However, it is open to us rather than supplying it direct to the, the uh, grid and being paid for, for that electricity by, by a power company, we can instead choose to supply it direct to a local company. And we are in active discussion with local companies to do precisely that. In other words, we supply them uh, with electricity direct from that solar generator through their existing grid connection, such that if there should be any surplus or anything, um, it can go back into the grid that way. And that is much, much cheaper um, to do that. Same principle applies elsewhere. Um, you, you can uh, uh, do this you know, in all sorts of places at all sorts of scales. Um, heat, it has to be a fairly big uh, uh, um, setup in order to make it viable in cost terms because digging trenches and his fitting heat pipes, particularly within dense urban areas is a very expensive thing to do. So uh, it has to be done very carefully uh, or, or with a known uh, uh, demand on hand, as it were, to serve in order to justify that capital cost. But I'm confident that there will be opportunities to do that, for example, uh, within Shrewsbury Town Centre and possibly also within Bridge North uh, using existing large heat generators. Um, uh, and in the case of Shrewsbury, it's possible we may be able to use the river. As we've talked about ground source heat pumps, and we've talked about air source heat pumps, but there are also water source heat pumps where in effect you're stripping temperatures, you, you, you're, you're stripping heat out of water um, through a heat pump and actually using that to heat buildings and so on. So these are all possibilities and uh, some of them more under more active development than others. Uh, battlefields certainly in the short term, uh, private power supply uh, direct to local users is absolutely something we're already exploring. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. And I think what you've just said uh, just demonstrates that you think smart according to what you've got, don't you? And try and see how you can how you can actually bend it to your needs. Very interesting. Um, I'm going to stop talking now and pass on the next question, please, Daniel. 
he's gone. Hello, Chair. Sorry, I'm here. Yes, it's Tina Woodward. Tina. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Tina Woodward. Thank you, Adrian. I think it's for you, really, procurement. Obviously, as a council, we try and buy as local as we can from our local service providers. Now, they are usually small businesses, medium sized businesses, and I'm a little bit concerned that obviously they may need help moving forward if they've got to do all of their, you know, I bought it from here, it's travelled there, it's done this, it's done the other. So basically their carbon footprint, I'm a little bit concerned with that. So I hope the council is going to assist and, and help them where we can. Obviously, there's something called social value, and I've got to be honest, um, can you clarify, please, because I don't know whether a small business could use that, say, as, a, as an offset in some way from, from the carbon perspective, their footprint. So obviously, if you could fill in a bit there, it would help me. Um, rec obviously, the tree planting scheme has gone very, very well. And I'm pleased that, you know, we're looking at working with some of our own contractors that, you know, to say, like, could you provide trees? Could you offset that way for our tree planting scheme? But obviously there's a failure rate with trees and they take to a certain point in time where they get to leaf, where they actually start contributing. So I understand from all the culturalists, that's a mouthful. I'm not going to do that one again. Um, so basically, have we got a figure, say 10% of failure and do we know when this takes place and are we taking that into account? Because it will be important. Also, the retrofit um, of our own housing stock that we've got. I mean, I think it's laudable to say that they're going to be up to passive house standard, but I'm a little bit mindful myself of what that could cost, the cost incurred to do that, as opposed to moving forward with a more realistic view of what can be done um, with those particular properties to make them, you know, more carbon efficient and also better for our, you know, people that are our tenants. Um, I'd like to also know more about the community climate action partnership because I believe we have had representatives present to our parish councils and trying to get them on board. But speaking of the parishes, the number of parishes that I represent, they are actually and have been working hard to actually um, change their street lighting to LED. They are already significantly contributing and I, I'm a bit concerned about the pressures coming on them to do more. Um, at this point in time, it, it, it's quite tricky. Um, with the plan, what I would say is the wording of it sometimes is quite difficult to pick through in here. I don't quite understand it. So other people might struggle as well when they say Shropshire Council is working to expand the range of staff incentives for low carbon behaviour in living, including via salary sacrifice schemes and staff reward schemes. I think all of that, maybe I need to read more documentation, I own up, but some of it to me it is quite, quite wordy and quite difficult to figure where we're actually trying to go. Um, you know, it's sort of like consider increasing social value weightings and different things in procurement. Sorry about that, but some of it is difficult to unpick, to be honest, Adrian. I don't know whether it's because we're all remote working, but it, it gets a little bit tricky. <laughs> so there's a few questions. Thank you. Well done, Tina. That's a good bundle there. Um, right. Can we scoot through these um, before you before you answer, Adrian and Dean? I wonder if I could just have an idea, please, Daniel, of how many more speakers we've got lined up. Uh, it's just Nick Hignan to follow after chair. Fine, that's that's lovely. OK, thanks so much. Right, uh, Adrian, I'm so sorry. Please, and Dean, please, um, please uh, uh, um, wend your way through through uh, Tina's questions. Do you want me to start, Dean? Absolutely. <laughs> you start, Adrian, and I'll chip in. OK, thank you. So Adrian Cooper, Task Force, uh, Climate Task Force Manager. Um, OK, starting with the small businesses. Yes, absolutely. Uh, 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 Tina, this is this is an issue. Um, I think the point is that um, it's worth remembering that we won't be the only people asking for this information. And in fact, I was making a presentation uh, on Friday to the uh, Shropshire Chamber of Commerce on this precise issue. Uh, and one of the points of that presentation was to say uh, this is a huge growth opportunity for the Shropshire economy, but you need to be ready. And the sooner you engage with this, the better. There is help out there and we're happy to help in principle as, as far as we can. 
Uh, and certainly there are business support organisations that will, will lend their shoulders to the wheel on this as well. Uh, it's about recognising the issue and having something uh, uh, sensible to say about it in the first instance. So, you know, um, and we are seeing even quite small businesses already starting to do this. Um, and I I'm firmly convinced of the fact that the, the Climate Action Partnership, the, the community-led organisation, SCAP, will actively help with this because a number of its um, leading members and, and people in key positions are from a business background and they are already engaged on this and happy to help people uh, uh, to, to make sense of it and what they can do about it. I think we will get to the point where you will be at an active disadvantage if you haven't, um, but equally, there's an opportunity to get ahead of the game and use it as a marketing tool. Um, so that, that's quite a, a, a thing, but certainly there is a need for, for targeted support to help our suppliers uh, to engage with this issue. And I would absolutely expect us to be doing that. Uh, in I terms of just chip in that, sorry, if I can just chip in there, Adrian, on that subject, Councillor Dean Carroll, portfolio holder, um, to give you a, a real life example Tina, Tina, of how this can benefit, how being local can benefit a producer. Um, there, there's a lot made, particularly around dietary issues and how uh, an, a meat intensive diet creates more carbon emissions than a plant based diet. But actually, if you take locally sourced and reared meat, you take, say, steak from from a cow or lamb from a lamb brought up and, and butchered in Shropshire and sold in Shropshire. The carbon emissions of that are actually lower than a soya bean based meal where an acre of rainforest in the in a tropical location has been cut down to to grow the soya beans. So actually it's not just about Partly it's about reverting our perceptions as well, and that can have a direct benefit for local producers. And that that example could be rolled out across all different kinds of industries as well. Thank you, Dean. Yeah, just picking up on the social value point, uh, in some ways it's a continuation of, of the, the previous point in the sense that um, Again, companies are being asked to demonstrate that they're engaged with social value, the social value agenda, and, and we and others uh, in responding to changes in national legislation will be looking for them to do that. And there's, there's a similar need to provide support on, on that agenda. It's very interesting looking at offsetting and these other non-financial benefits that derive from, from a lot of what we buy in. And I'll give you as an example, there's a really interesting one, um, which somewhat surprisingly actually comes from highways. So the council was approached recently by one of its highway contractors who said, we've got a million pound contract to repair some roads. We can do this for you net zero. Um, and we said, yes, please. <laughs> um, but what they did was um, they, they had found a way of reducing their process, the, the, the carbon intensity of their process. But then the residual they offset and they offset in Shropshire and they were then able to say, right, um, you know, your the outcome of your contract is, is net zero carbon because we have uh, offset the residual footprint of what we were doing for you um, by investing in local, in this case, tree planting. And, and that brings us very neatly to uh, your, your next point, which was around how much do you um, do you not do mark down tree planting as a form of capturing carbon? The, the blunt fact of the matter is that trees don't really capture any carbon until they're about five years old. OK, um, so you do have to apply a discount, but that is done as part of the uh, sort of carbon measuring process that comes from uh, issuing carbon credits. And, and the carbon credits, the administration of carbon credits is administered internationally, unsurprisingly, so that you have a, a level playing field across uh, um, you know, the whole world. It is a global issue after all, um, uh, between different countries and, and, and different uses and so on, that there has to be an accredited outcome in terms of how much carbon has been captured. So you would need to do relatively more tree planting than 
uh, some other activity, for example. Um, and these days, there is uh, very much a, a, an emphasis on, on looking at the, the qualitative aspects of what is actually being done to capture carbon. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that you asked about this, <laughs> because there's a very exciting thing waiting in the wings here, where we're looking actively at whether Shropshire Council could establish its own scheme, either working in concert with an existing carbon credits issuer, or indeed by setting up our own, uh, in order to uh, attract investment from people wishing to offset uh, uh, their carbon performance by buying credits from us, which we would then be using to support carbon capture work within the county. And it would have that specific geography. So you can see if you were a small local company and you'd, uh, with a bit of help, measured what the carbon uh, footprint of your activity was, and you wanted to buy carbon credits to offset the residual amount that you hadn't managed to reduce, potentially moving forward, you could do that in Shropshire and you could then point to the things that have gone on and say to your clients, look, we've paid for that. <laughs> in marketing terms, this is potential dynamite in my view. OK, uh, moving swiftly on, uh, conscious of the time, retrofit of housing stock. Um, large parts of the council's housing stock actually perform reasonably well in terms of the social housing that we own, for example, um, uh, where we have properties that don't. It's usually because it's very difficult for us to gain access to carry out those improvements. Obviously, they have to be done with agreement with the tenant, and, and that's not always very easy to achieve. Uh, we are also working very closely with all the other registered providers um, who have social housing in Shropshire uh, to the same end. And so uh, um, uh, all of those marches, reeking various firms are all uh, working with us very carefully, very closely in terms of uh, accessing government grants to support this type of work. And we have a number of pilot schemes which we, we've, we're running. So, for example, we, we have about uh, half a million pounds. Actually, no, it's a million pounds, I'm sorry, um, which we're currently investing in what we've termed a uh, whole house retrofit. So we're looking, we're taking a, a poorly performing house currently and we're applying uh, some fairly intensive improvements to reduce the heat loss and, and improve its energy efficiency. And in terms of the cost of that, it is costly to do on a whole house basis. But there are other benefits uh, other than simply saving money. I mean, the, the first thing I'm supposed to say is that it seems to me really important uh, that people on low incomes uh, uh, should also benefit from low heating and fuel bills um, because you know it's a significant part of their of their budget and if we can help them to reduce that that is an excellent thing to do uh, the second thing uh, really is that um, they uh, I've lost my thread now uh, where was I going with that oh yes um, moving forward obviously we can start to look at um, uh, other other improvements in terms of new build, um, particularly to, to help capture some of those things. But there are health benefits associated with this as well. I mean, there's a whole health argument around improving internal air quality, much of which will result from the sorts of improvements that we're talking about. So living in, in colder, damp houses actually uh, costs Shropshire Council as a service provider a very great deal of money on an annual basis because people have poorer health as a result, both mental and physical. Um, and we, in the, as a provider, the key provider of social care services, uh, that is an additional cost for us uh, and a burden on our service provision, which may be partly avoidable if we're able to help people achieve a better indoor uh, air quality and environment. So all sorts of things to consider there. Uh, you asked about uh, the Shropshire Climate Action Partnership and parish councils. Um, I think the point about the Climate Action Partnership is it's there as a coordinating mechanism. It is not seeking to supplant or undermine anybody's existing efforts. If ever there was a cooperative agenda, it's this one. We are literally all in it together. <laughs> So um, they aren't trying to say, well, you must do it this way or, or we want you to do this uh, and not that. It's, uh, it's a broad church. What they're doing is trying to support parish councils, I understand, 
in, in engaging with the agenda, providing some access to technical expertise and so on, uh, to try and help parish councils take local actions that they may be best suited to, to deliver, including indeed the, the uh, street lighting that you've already referenced. And there may be other things that SCAP can help them to achieve or can coordinate access to funding between parish councils, which would give them the ability to do things they might not otherwise be able to afford. Uh, final thing was, was on the wording and a uh, particular aspect. Yes, apologies for that. It, it is unfortunately uh, the technical wording does tend to creep into some of these things. As you know, uh, it's a bit of a, a difficult one to avoid. It is quite a technically complex area, and I think we may have to consider providing a glossary to some of these things to help with that. I mean, in terms of salary sacrifice specifically, um, I, I'd referenced earlier, I think, the, uh, the carbon balance of staff home working. But Shropshire Council, it seems to me, has an organisational responsibility to help its staff reduce their own carbon footprints, uh, whether they're at work or not, frankly. And uh, one way of doing that might be to um, actually help them access funding to make improvements to their home uh, in terms of energy efficiency through uh, a salary sacrifice, which is a, a scheme whereby you're paying out of your gross salary and effectively you're not paying tax on uh, the improvements that you're paying for. So it's, um, it is a national uh, approach and it's done for various things. The, the, the common ones are childcare vouchers and uh, uh, bicycle purchases. Uh, many people don't realise incidentally you can go out there today and buy an electric bike and pay for it using your gross salary. Um, so there's a significant saving uh, you know, for, for most people in terms of tax on this. Uh, which reduces the cost to you. But the same principle can be applied to other things. Um, we're looking at the moment at introducing a ultra low carbon uh, vehicle option. So you may be able to go out and acquire a hybrid or an electric vehicle through a council run scheme uh, on a lease uh, paid for out of your gross salary as a member of staff. Um, but that could also apply in future to home improvements. I think that's more than enough given given the time. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Adrian. That was uh, re really quite a run over the sticks. Thanks very much indeed. Um, now, uh, Nick Hignett, and then I think we're going to have to wrap this discussion up just because we have got more items on the agenda which we need to cover. So, um, Nick. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Nick Hignett, Councillor for May Valley Ward. Um, I'm going to make this fairly quick because I, I know we've got time constraints and most of the uh, points that I wanted to raise have been covered. I just wanted to go back to one particular point which uh, has been raised by the last speaker, Councillor Woodward, uh, and that's concerning involving parish councils and, and obviously town councils as well, but I can only really speak uh, as a rural councillor on behalf of parish councils. Uh, I regard May Valley as being quite forward looking. Uh, there is a climate uh, action emergency group in the Ray Valley and they're very forward thinking, including things like wildflower meadows and leaving verges and uh, cutting the grass less and up to larger projects, which we've got possibly Minsky Parish Council involved in. And we're hoping to, uh, in the next 12 months, install solar powered lighting on the cycleway footpath between Ponsby and Minsky, which is uh, over a mile in length, so it's quite a big project. And that, uh, we're looking at quotes for that now. But my, my question really to Daniel or to Dean was um, whether we could involve parish councils more. And I'm thinking along the lines of perhaps uh, a monthly update, if that's not too onerous, uh, on the principle that every little helps. I think the more we can involve parish councils and obviously to a larger extent town councils, uh, I think it will help us to move this forward and every parish council in, in the county does need to be thinking about this, whether, if, whether they have a separate subcommittee to look into these things or not. So that's, that's just my question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Nick. Um, Adrian or Dean? Chair, if I may, it's Councillor Dean Carroll, portfolio holder. In, in terms of what um, Councillor Hignett has said, it may be of interest to know that there has been quite extensive um, and very well received input into SCAP, the Shropshire Climate Action Partnership, by parish and town councils through the medium of SALC, the Shropshire Association of Local Councils. And in fact, the chair of the, um, the chairman of SCAP, 
who has just been elected and confirmed to his position is actually a vice chairman of SALC as well. So there were all kinds of links and crossovers. Parish and town councils were also one of the largest uh, sectors that took up the offer of the community tree scheme. Um, they they took on and have planted thousands of trees. Mm -hmm. And we've had numerous inquiries from them about improving village halls, um, bus stops, all kinds of facilities they own and operate. And Nick's absolutely right that they will be a, a key partner in delivering county-wide change because they don't only represent the the holdings of the parish councils themselves but also of their communities and their membership which which um, are also separately represented in terms of landowners businesses rural enterprises farmers also separately represented on the climate action partnership and so I think it's an excellent idea to keep in regular contact through SAUC with parish councils and I will take that away and talk to Adrian about that in our next um, fortnightly portfolio meeting. Um, if I don't have anything else to say Chair, can I just say thank you very much to committee for the time. I felt that this has been a hugely useful um, use of use of the afternoon. I thought it's been hugely beneficial and we'll be more than happy to come back and discuss with you as you as you wish. Dean, thank you very much indeed. And Adrian, too. Um, I would like to thank you both enormously for having fielded so many questions, um, not least mine. Um, but I do at the same time feel that we're still scratching the surface of this. So I wonder whether we might book you up to come back in six months time, because I suspect then things will have developed. Um, we can talk about this uh, in more detail. New things will have, will have, will have come uh, into the mix. And I think it would be hugely useful for us as well, hopefully as, as giving you an opportunity to just, uh, you know, keep telling us about about the different things that are going on in this in this very varied and sometimes quite complex field. So can I uh, please, on behalf of the committee, um, extend uh, warm thanks to both of you. Um, we have a recommendation here that the Communities Overview Committee supports the Corporate Climate Action Plan and Project Pipeline 2020 Appendix 1. Um, we didn't really go through the project pipeline, but you did actually mention it, um, Adrian, and I think I'm sure everybody will have read it. Um, as a live document, which will be updated frequently to reflect rapid changes in technology and resources which are expected to influence this work. Is everybody um, happy with that, please? Can I have a proposer? Can't Moved, hear anybody. Moved, Sorry? Chairman. Moved. Thank you very much indeed. That's lovely. Um, uh, um, if if anybody is not happy with that, would they say so now? And I'll take a vote. But I can't see that there's anything about this that which they wouldn't be happy with. I'd be surprised anyway. Um, no silence. Great. Uh, thank you both so very much. Uh, we've taken up a lot of your time, for which I apologise. But I think it's been an extremely useful debate. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Now, can we move on to um, public rights way? and an update on this. This is something which we uh, looked at a while ago now, I think. Um, March and September 2019, is that right? Yes, I think so. Um, and um, we, we were keen to ask the Public Rights Away team to come back because um, I certainly as chair of this committee um, have uh, seem have experienced a decline in accessibility of the public rights of way around me, which is not actually anything to do with our public rights of way team, I hasten to add, but um, I think has been due to some action by farmers and landowners who are concerned about um, a public ac accessibility during the COVID-19 outbreak. So um, can I please welcome I think we have Shona Butter, 
and um, Pete Banford of the Rights of Way team. Is that right? That's correct, Chair. Yes, Chair. Great. OK. Um, and do you have a uh, do you have an update for us? Uh, it's Pete Banford here, Chair, uh, Interim Outdoor Partnership Manager. Um, members should have received uh, the report that's been put together by uh, Shona Butter, um, yeah. basically providing an update um, since, uh, as you rightly say, uh, we've uh, presented to this committee in March and September 2019. Um, just to remind uh, members of the, 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 the network itself, um, Shropshire Council has a statutory duty of a network of 5,600 kilometres of public rights of way, which is the third largest in the United Kingdom. Um, we have a statutory duty under the Highways Act 1980 to make sure that uh, the network remains uh, open and accessible. Um, basically, as, as you rightly uh, suggest, there, there's been a, a number number of challenges um, concerning the our statutory duty uh, concerning the network. Um, COVID-19 has really sort of um, enhanced and, and really focused those those challenges. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a, a, a flavour of that, um, there's been a 215% increase in the number of issues being logged on our, our management system. There's been a 180% increase in general issues been re re reported. Uh, um, there's also challenges for us in terms of our physical delivery of the um, our work. Um, for example, since moving out of Shah Hall um, due to working from home, we've had a number of IT issues with our mapping enforcement team. We also uh, rely uh, um, on our fantastic volunteer uh, network. Um, just to give you a, an idea, the amount of voluntary work on our network per year equates to about five and a half full time equivalent staff. And because of the COVID restrictions, those volunteers haven't been able to go out, out and work in a way that we would deem to be um, covering all the health and safety legislation, not just to do with COVID but also to do with loan working and working with um, you know heavy items and, 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 and various pieces of uh, machinery and tools. Um, so despite these challenges um, I'd personally like to say as the interim manager that uh, I'm very proud of my team. Um, we have had a, a quite a, a challenging 12 months and over the last sort of decade we have um, experienced as, as have many local authorities and many teams within those local authorities a number of cuts which has seen our, our, our team and our resources um, you know reduce. We also uh, at the end of March we got involved uh, with the um, response to Covid and it was the outdoor partnership team that uh, has delivered over a thousand food parcels and nearly 200 yeah. uh, PPE drops. One of the reasons why we were deemed to be the best team to do that was because of the fantastic knowledge that my colleagues have of the geography of Shropshire, but also we've obviously got the uh, the vehicles, whether they be vans or off-road vehicles to get down the bumpy tracks and find the isolated properties where people were shielding and requ required food. Um, just to give you an update of what we have done to try and address some of these issues, um, we've put in a capital bid um, for the maintenance of our bridges. Um, we've got nearly 3,500 bridges. Some of those bridges are just a couple of railway sleepers over, over a small watercourse. Others uh, um, form part of a disused railway network and can be a, a Victorian arched brick uh, build, um, built bridge, which comes with all the uh, technical and um, engineering requirements. But we've put in a uh, we put in a bid for that and we've got a £200,000 uh, capital spend to, to go on our bridges this year. We're also successful in securing funding for a bridge inspector 
but because of COVID restrictions, we haven't been able to recruit to that post um, as yet, but we are looking to put that in that in place. Um, my colleague Shona Butter has also put a business case together to uh, recruit two new additional rights of way legal order and enforcement officers within the mapping enforcement team uh, and this is pending uh, approval. Um, part of that was two of our most experienced uh, officers both retired within weeks of each other and so we're busy trying to train up new officers which again is not as easy uh, when you when you're working uh, remotely. Um, we've also got some new uh, legislative uh, reforms and challenges um, which uh, comes in the form of the Deregulation Act 2015 uh, which is intended to simplify and speed up and reduce costs and administration burdens associated with the uh, the rights of way procedures. Um, up until about uh, time goes so quick, I'm losing track of the time. But up until about 18 months ago, um, my involvement with the outdoor partnership team uh, was delivering a European funding grant, and so, so I've been on a bit of a steep learning curve. But one of the things. Things I can um, share with committee members is the, uh, the fantastic knowledge, not just of the Shropshire network, but of the our statutory duty and, and the statutes that govern, um, you know, the, our responsibilities throughout the Shropshire, both on our parks and sites and, and our rights and net, rights of way network. Our greatest asset, as it is with most teams, are the people that that, that work there, and you know. I would again uh, echo my sort of uh, appreciation for the team's efforts during these um, difficult times. Um, Councillor Woodward's present today, and I know we've got a, a couple of uh, issues in, in her area regarding some, some boats, but what that really highlights is, to me is the fact that one of our challenges is the, um, the multi-use of our rights of way network. And particularly around some of our uh, protected parks and sites where we might have mountain bikers, horse riders, walkers, off-road uh, vehicle drivers all coming together. Um, and obviously with the um, COVID restrictions, it really, has in it really has sort of focused us how important the network is to local people, but it, it, it's also created some issues for us with regards to overcrowding and, and all the associated issues with that such as dog fouling litter collection um, but it is something that we we would like to encourage in a in a positive way um, going back to sort of the social prescribing and the, the 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 ability to use the great outdoors and the opportunity to exercise and the impact that the the great outdoors can have on physical and mental health. It's something we want to capture and work with local communities to make sure that the increased footfall isn't having a negative effect on um, local communities. And, and that means as a team, we've had to build really good relationships with our other um, council colleagues, for example, in highways. And indeed, managing the, the public spaces We'll be working closely with Adrian's team, um, particularly around things like tree planting and any other carbon offset or, or, or ideas that we we uh, we could work uh, together in. So, unless Shona Butter, uh, my colleagues, got anything to add to the report that I might have missed out, um, I'm more than happy for us to uh, take any questions, Chair. Pete, thank you very much. That was a very concise report. Um, and I'd like to follow up on a few points with you afterwards. Shona, uh, do you want to come in? Um, I think, um, thank you, Chair. Um, Shona Butter, Rights Away um, Mapping and Enforcement Manager. Um, I don't think so, um, Chair. I think Pete gave quite a good summary of, of our report and the, and the pressures we've been facing. So quite happy to answer any questions members may have. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I have to say that um, I think uh, you have been under an awful lot of pressure, pressure um, particularly because of COVID, but also it strikes me that the, uh, the rights of way have really been thrown into sharp relief, haven't they? 
um, by the fact that people are taking quite seriously this this uh, um, the fact that they are allowed to exercise um, and are taking full advantage of that with the consequent pressure therefore on the rights of way and it seems to me that it must be very difficult for you to actually balance that um, I mean I'm, I'm mindful of uh, the pressure that some of our so uh, some of our beauty spots so-called have come under during the during the Covid pandemic um, and it, it it seems to me that there are a lot of people who just want to go out into the countryside and walk um, and we have problems sometimes with the way that they understand or don't understand how they should be using the rights of way and uh, the fact that if there are like they are going through fields and there are livestock, that it is important to shut the gates, etc., etc., etc. And I wonder whether that's had anything to do with um, uh, the fact that some of the rights of way are becoming uh, blocked uh, or uh, or impeded by things like um, padlocks on the gates, that sort of thing, in order to prevent people going through. And I just wonder whether you've had um, a lot of uh, complaints or concerns uh, in in that kind of area since co since the pandemic started. Um, it's Pete Bamford again, uh, Interim Outdoor Partnership Manager. Um, I'll ask Shona to to come in with any specifics, but I've requested that uh, two of my colleagues give them a report every Monday morning on the sort of the public usage of our networks and, and, and parks and sites and certainly for the first two weekends following Christmas we were seeing massive uh, increase and um, more sort of inappropriate behaviour. One of the issues that we've uh, um, found to be quite challenging is the definition of the national guidance particularly the word local. Uh, so for example this weekend, we've seen uh, heavy footfall on Liff Hill, just south of uh, Basin Hill. And of course, people travelling out of Shrewsbury would indeed class that as, as local. Uh, I myself live in uh, Clun, and I can actually leave my doorstep and find uh, a nice place to walk. So I would feel that actually getting in my motor vehicle and, and travelling to a site would not be in the spirit of the what the national guidance regarding the COVID restrictions is trying to achieve. But certainly we are seeing more and more um, what I would deem as uh, not local trip uh, taking place. And that is seems to be what is triggering a lot of um, bad feeling from local people, which may cause them to take their own action and indeed block the, the rights of way network. I, I don't know, if Sh Shone, if you could, could add to that. Thank you. Um, yeah, Shona Butter, Rights Way um, Mapping and Enforcement Manager. Um, Chair, I can confirm um, the initial lockdown, definitely. We spent the first probably three months um, dealing with issues of obstruction, where people were very concerned either for their own health or um you know just just scared really um and um they were locking gates and preventing access so we did spend a considerable amount of time working on that and producing posters that um local people could put up who had rights of way just advising um both members of the public um users and and you know for for their own um good what they should and shouldn't be doing um, at that time, um, which was later backed up by um, DEFRA. We managed to get some proper formal um, guidance from DEFRA, which um, we were able to use as well. Um, since that time, we haven't had so many reports of actual obstructions, but we have had been inundated, as, as Pete said, with the number of issues being reported. It has it doubled initially and now we are at around about 135 percent increase, both in general queries relating to rights of way of any sort um, and the same in the actual issues being logged on our maintenance system. Um, and what's happening is you're getting people who are not used to going out in the countryside going out. 
um, and not quite aware of you know what the, the the do's and the don'ts are you still have the odd um, situation where we are getting obstructions um, and um, I don't know if members are aware there's been a couple of um, more recent things for example Natural England are looking at um, a revamp of the countryside code to try and help um, raise awareness of, of you know your responsibilities and actions when you're out in the countryside and um, there's also been some publicity from the National Farmers Union whereby um, to avoid mud um, users are spreading themselves much wider than the legal line of the right of way so there is some um, upset amongst the farming and landholding community where effectively they're getting trespass because of the sheer volume of people who are out there um, and wishing to avoid avoid the sort of ground conditions that we get at this time of year um, but that is obviously having an impact on their, their businesses so that's something else that is, is sort of uppermost at the moment. Thank you, yeah. Shona. That's uh, that that I think um, that's actually very helpful and rather rather confirms what I'd heard. So um, it, it is a tricky thing. The, the only the only, if you like, the upside to, to all this is the fact that it really has raised the profile of our rights away. Um, and I do hope that somehow we may be able to um, act on this as hopefully we pull out of COVID. Um, so that the rights of way are better understood, um, uh, used more sympathetically, but also so that it helps you in your quest to ensure that that uh, you can you have sufficient staff to um, actually undertake repairs and and do your your mapping and enforcement. Um, uh, just because the value of the of our rights of way has really shown itself over this uh, over this pandemic, I, I must say. Um, right, uh, questions please. Daniel, do you have questions? Because I can't pick anything up on the chat. Uh, yeah, OK, no problem. Uh, the, the question was, I think Vivian Parry has already actually uh, asked her question. No. No. OK, so no. It's, it's Vivian, uh, then after that chair is Tina Woodward. Right. Uh, I'd just like to say it as well as everybody else, thank you very much for coming today. You work very hard and thank you, Shauna, for everything you've done to me in the past. Um, to help with sorting out some of my rights of way in the Richards Castle end of Shropshire. Um, because I have five parishes, as you know. Um, I find that it's the same as what Celia is, is saying about people blocking pathways off and with barbed wire and uh, locking gates and things. But the trouble with me is I'm getting people that are coming from Hereford side, then they get in touch with their counsellors and they get in touch with me and want to know what the heck we're doing in Shropshire, blocking our pathways off. I have explained to them all the things that you've been doing and all with COVID and everything, and that it's very hard really to get some of these things done uh, and, and how hard you work. So I want to assure you I've done that. I have got an issue with a, a boat though. Um, um, this boat is, is not being maintained properly. It's on a slope. Uh, which has got had heavy rain and it's in a dangerous condition. Um, horses and people walk along it. Um, uh, Shropshire Council filled in the drains um, and saw to the drains, I should say, a few years ago. And, and the heavy stone is now filling all these in. Uh, if you could let me know, are Shropshire Council responsibility for uh, things regarding lanes? Because this one, the water runs down into the houses at the bottom, terraced houses. And so if, 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 if it could if, possibly... Can I just ask if, you, is it part of the boat? Is, is it yes, part, the boat. By way of part of the boat? Part of the boat, yes. Right. Okay. The, the lane itself is the boat. Right. And unfortunately, um, nothing has been done to it for years. So if I passed all this information on, could you have a look at it for me and, and see what you think? Yeah, we can certainly answer again. Certainly, um, Councillor Parry, if you if you um, if you could send the information to me, I'll make sure that that gets to the appropriate officers That's to look at for you. 
it, it depends on the circumstances as to who's responsible for what. But if it is a boat and it's the surface, then we are responsible for the surface in so far as the public's usage. Yes. Um, it's a very bad also, condition. sometimes it's a mixture of public and private. So mm. we need to look at it to establish. But yes. if you send it through, that's fine. We'll we'll have a look. But can I, keep, can I say to you how much you have helped me in the past? And you really are very, very good. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank Viv. you. Um, I think that just your your response just there, Shona, does illustrate uh, the complications arising from these boats. That one assumes that they're open to all traffic. Um, one assumes that, that therefore they're in public ownership, but of course they they aren't necessarily, or maybe bits of them are and bits of them aren't. And it, your job must be made an awful lot more difficult as a result. Right. Um, thank you for that response, uh, Tina Woodward. Thank you, Chair Tina Woodward. Shona, I must admit, um, obviously, thank you for your help. And I've got a number of questions, which I think you thought I would have, being as I was mentioned by Pete in dispatches earlier. <laughs> what I would say is that obviously the figures here that you give by percentage increases without knowing the baseline, it's really difficult to know what numbers we're talking about. You know, did you have 50 and it's gone up by 215 percent? It, it, it would be lovely to know the figures that we're actually working on to understand what pressures you are under. And I don't doubt you are because of my own division. The other thing is, is staff or are staff, sorry, still in redeployed at the moment on COVID activity? I think that probably goes to Pete because obviously you're a small team anyway. So obviously we've entered 2021, sadly, with another lockdown. And it's just figuring out now if, if, if the team is as it should be or redeployed, working hard on other things, admittedly. Now, moving to the boats in my division, it's not a case of areas being locked by farmers or by inconsiderate people who just, you know, have issues. My boats are actually still being used now by trail bikers. I walk them and I've met some on Sunday and they said to me that they believe they're allowed to do that. It's exercise. Now, you know, I don't know. So I've gone to the police, but I am disturbed by this because obviously the boat network actually connects onto our other rights of way, which are the bridleways and other areas. They form a significant part of the network and actual other users are now being driven off those routes by an element which I believe is increasing in my experience and that is reported to me of four by four users and trail riders who mm. are being less than considerate to say the least to other users and I can honestly say that has been the case that I have witnessed. I would say that at the moment we've still got issues. I've got one boat in particular which I'm working with you and obviously Richard Knight but the damage is more than significant and you know it it's problematic to us so obviously I really need to find ways forward for our network and I think it does require the council to actually look at funding and how you are funded because mm. as Cecilia says our network is vital to us and if we are going to stay in a Covid situation for a number of months still, then this pressure is not going to go away for the team and for our network. So I think this is a really good opportunity to raise those concerns. Tina, thank you very much for that. Um, Shona, Pete, would you like to just respond to uh, yeah. those points? OK, thank you, Chet. Uh, Pete Bunn for the Interim Outdoor Partnership Manager. If I just pick up on the ones that I can then I'll pass over to uh, Shona so mm -hmm. in terms of the staff redeployment um, we we never really um, because it happened so quickly in the first lockdown we never officially redeployed any staff it was just an additional task that we did I spoke quite closely with my line manager and what we've done over the last few months is actually given the delivery of the food which is which is really decrease now any rate to the theatre staff within our, our department because obviously the theatre is closed so although we're not doing anything um, that I would class is going to have an impact on the service we still do the occasional delivery of PPE to within the community 
and because of our four by four vehicles um for example last week when we had the floods i went out, out and took some carers to a flooded property so that that individual could get care but it's it's you know once in a, in a blue moon just going on to the issue with the boats it doesn't matter what exercise you're doing it's all about staying local and it's something that's very difficult for us to enforce because yeah. it's open up to interpretation but also we haven't got the power to enforce the stay local message that's a police matter but certainly i would say four by four vehicles on boats at the moment it's or, or indeed trial bikes if they're not local people and even if they're four by four vehicles you know is that exercise it's not really in the spirit of what we're trying to achieve with lockdowns we have tried to work closely with with the police particularly around uh, our parks and sites but they have limited resources during the first lockdown what we did look at is whether or not we could set up some what we called park wardens and maybe we could extend that to some of our more challenging uh, rights of way networks where we'd actually redeploy people into the outdoor partnership team i've recently done a paper to my line managers about the potential risk of this situation becoming worse as we enter spring and summer if we still are still in lockdown sometimes the weather is our friend uh, even though it's cold and rainy outside it can have a positive impact on on the reduction of of numbers uh, using our, our our network and our parks and sites but obviously what we may see as the night straw out as the, the you know we get the dry weather we might be inundated again so this is something i've made my line managers aware of and they're going to discuss it to see again whether or not more staff can be made available for for this period of, of, of time dur during covid um Sean, if you if you if you could pick up with the the baseline figures and a bit more, more about the boats that'd be great thank you yes no problem um Shona butter rights away mapping and enforcement manager um yes councillor Woodward. um the figures i can give you the figures um because I, I had to do an update more recently um the initial figures which i have detailed in the report were from the period of april to july um but what I've done is I've done an update since then. So I've done the whole year, um, obviously, because we've we, we finished 2019 um, and I've done most of this year. So there's two months still to go. But for example, in 2019, we um, recorded 729 issues that went onto our maintenance database. And this year so far, we're at 956 um, already. And we've got two more months to go. That's issues that we actually log on the system to action. As for general issues coming in, in um, 2019 to March 2020, we received 1,673 issues. And this year to date, bearing in mind we've got February and March yet, we have had 2,161. So that gives you an indication that doesn't include where um, officers have been contacted directly. So that's, that's I can't count that. So you've got that on top. Um, so those are the, the figures, which is why we, you know, we can justify the fact that we have had a massive increase and we're not alone. Uh, the, um, one of the organisations I belong to that relates to rights of way, um, they've just recently put a survey out to all authorities to try and get a, an idea of the pressures and the increases and all the all the issues that have been, you know, affecting rights of way because of COVID, etc. Um, in respect of the boats, um, we're sort of experiencing it everywhere um, in that increased usage um, and um, particularly the issue, um, Council Woodward, that, that we are going to be discussing, you know, um, in more detail separately to this meeting. Um, it's looking at the options that are available to us and, and that, I think that's more than anything that is frustrating because as Pete said, we have very limited bits of legislation that help us with these, these statuses because often the higher status routes were subjects of legal orders, which meant they've already been through a due legal process to categorise them at that, that status. 
Therefore, in order to try and downgrade them, you cannot unless you have very extreme reasons to do so. And therefore, you have to look at different pieces of legislation. So, for example, Chair, we're looking at the moment at the potential of using um, traffic regulation orders um, just to prevent the vehicular usage um, to allow is to regenerate because a lot of it is the damage that is happening to the actual nature of the route itself um, and the one in particular has other issues that involve the environment agency um, and we've got several unfortunately all in um, Councillor Woodward's area where we've tried practical measures we've tried temporary seasonal traffic regulation orders so at the moment we're just looking at what can we do right now because I, I don't know if I'm right or wrong but I understand that most of the damage is being caused by these 4x4 users and trail bike riders who are, I understand, coming from outside of our area in the main and they don't belong to proper groups that are responsible and are acting responsibly. Um, but I have contacted our, our sort of professional legally recognised groups to, to see if they have any suggestions on how we can also manage this situation and try and, and, and resolve it. Shona, thank you very much. Thank and very Pete, much. That, um, that I have to say is a familiar story because I had a problem in my division some time ago. And it, it is exactly that. It's people coming in from, you know, from uh, outside the county, let alone outside the area. Um, and, and how on earth do you manage to control that? Um, there was just one thing that I just wanted to pick up with you before uh, we let you go. And I'm very grateful to you for having come. And I'm very glad that we've that we've had this update with you because it's been it's been a really important one. Um, you say in five one under future pressures that there's an inability to reinvest reinvest income from contracting works back into the service. Could you just elaborate on that a little because that sounds um, slightly uh, unfair? Yeah, uh, it's uh, Pete Van. Bamford Interim at your partnership manager. So in order to um, fulfil our statutory duty, um, as our budgets have shrank over the last decade, uh, uh, back in 2015, I think it was, we've de we decided to uh, set up a contractual arm of our countryside maintenance team. There are also other pockets of funded income that we, we generate through our cafe sales and, and uh, and things like that when we get that income if at the end of a financial year we've generated profit that money has to go back into the wider council coffers so we can't set up a sinking fund for example to replace equipment we can't roll money forward at the end of the financial year we have to declare the um the income and if it's seen as a, a, a saving or if it's seen as a, a um, resulting in an underspend because our bu budget's increased and our expenditure hasn't uh, been as, as high as ex uh, anticipated, that money does not stay with the outdoor partnership team. That's something that's common uh, across the whole of the council. Mm. Other sort of uh, concerns for me as a manager is Every time a laptop breaks down, it's £700 we have to buy off uh, for a new laptop. Again, we can't set up sinking funds uh, to do with, with, mm -hmm. with um, replacing IT equipment. So although it's really good to generate income and uh, we do use our income to make sure that we replenish our, our stock of gates, kissing gates, materials, um, we do have to write a business case that shows that any new staff that we want to recruit will be met by the, the income generated uh, um, within our maintenance team. Um, the, the, the business case that was uh, highlighted in 3.2 for the two mapping enforcement officers, that is seeking additional f uh, funding to mm. our, bo our bottom line budget. But that that's that's the problem we face is that we can't carry that money forward and it's common that is common to, to, to council processes presumably it's common to local government processes as well is it or is this just peculiar to Shropshire Council um I don't know other local authorities and um 
the way I'd like to put it for the purpose of the minutes is, is that my understanding is that it's common for all, all teams that money cannot be carried forward without exceptional circumstances and permissions from finance. Money cannot be carried forward at the end of the financial year. OK, thank you for clarifying that, Pete. Very much indeed. Um, right. Do we have any more questions, Daniel? Uh, yes, we do, Chair. Um, uh, I think Les has a question, and so does uh, Councillor Clark. OK, if, uh, I'd be grateful, uh, gentlemen, if you could if you could make your questions fairly uh, concise, if you would, just because I think we're running out of time. We've got one more uh, one more item that we need to cover. So, um, Les. Thanks, thanks, thanks Chairman. Um, Les Wood, member for Bruce North West and Tasley. Um, I would just like to say to Pete and Shona, for such a small department in the outdoor recreation and mapping, you do a tremendous job. And I think with, with COVID, with what you've been doing, we, you, we owe you our thanks and, and the thanks of the community for that, um, over and above all your duties. Um, it's obvious, and, and, and whenever you come to your department, um, you always get a positive response. I've never failed to get uh, an end to a story, if you like. So thank you and thank you to your staff. I think that should be passed back. And it's obvious to me that you're not only underfunded and understaffed, um, that what you've just suggested is holding on to money at the end of an end of the year when you perhaps have made a profit is a, a damn good idea. And I think, Chairman, we should be taking this back and, and um, pointing this out that, that this is a, a possible way forward to help this section. But I think we should thank Pete and Shona and all the staff for what they're doing. It's such a small band of people and it's such a positive outcome whenever you get involved with them. Thank you very much for that, Les. And um, I echo your, your sentiments entirely. Um, uh, thanks for that. Right, Ted. Thank you, Chair. Ted Clark Buncombe, um, pleased to meet you. Um, very briefly, um, uh, thank you the, the, all the right away staff for their efforts to uh, try and resolve, nothing's been properly resolved as yet, all the Cavalier developers along the Otley Road who are uh, quite um, cynically crossing uh, and blocking rights away without providing alternatives as yet. I've muted myself. Thank you for that, Ted. Um, is, do, does that need a comment from anybody? Chair, I can I can sort of comment. Thank if you, Shona. Like a comment. Um, Shona Butter, a rights away mapping and enforcement manager. Um, Yes, Councillor Clark. Um, my colleague actually is, is, deals with planning, um, and um, particularly where we have developers who put in temporary closures or temporary orders while they're doing development. We have had chair a particular issue in the Otley Road area because there's quite a lot of development. Everybody knows that facility, um, um, but unfortunately, they did agree to put in an alternative um, because it's a very well used area. Um, but as I understand it, um, that didn't actually take place when they said it would. So my colleague has had to inform all the locals and residents in that area that um, it will be hopefully being put in place, but there's been a delay. The, the bottom line, however, I'm afraid, is that they don't have to put an alternative in and they are perfectly entitled to apply for a closure while they do the works. And I understand that there are ditches, et cetera, that you wouldn't maybe be able to see um, from the road, et cetera, that do make it a danger for people to cross it at the moment. But we are working on that. It's very hard to get an alternative because we know it's a well-used area. All right. Yeah. Uh, Shona and um, and Pete, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank indeed. you for that. Um, thanks so much. Um, uh, Daniel, do we have any recommendations attached to this report? Oh, just one moment uh, before we do, uh, Keith Roberts had a question as well. Oh, and sorry, that came before you. your. Uh... Yeah. So, thank you, Chair. It's Councillor Keith Roberts, Radbrook Division. Um, yes, I, I walk miles on the footpath where I live, and the, the local. Peter's mentioned um, mountain bikers, etc. But problem I come I've come across quite a lot recently is horse riders, and they're they're in, in twos and threes, and they're actually riding on what I call a footpath, not a bridleway, 
and through narrow sections of the footpath, which is the cutting in Hanley Lane, going up to Baston Hill. And I, the other morning I was out with my dog and I was coming down the cutting, which is about four foot wide, and was challenged and I'd quite, shall we say, quite a lot of abuse off this, off this one lady on the front horse. And she she instructed me to clear the, clear the way as she wanted to go past um, with her horse, with her friend. And there's no way I could do that because it's on your little cutting. And my dog doesn't take friendly to horses. And shall we say there was confrontation and I held them back until I could get out of the narrow section. So there's a lots of that. And it's what they're doing with it, damaging the footpaths, chewing it up with their, with their, their horses going over it. Um, but this, this, yeah, this, there's a little bit of confrontation, but I just say what the job you're doing and trying to trying to, trying to get the value of what you can do for for the footpaths in this county is 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 amazing, Shona, and keep up the good work. But there is problems. Well, not just bikers, it's horse riders, and everybody seems to be out and about doing what they want to do because that's what they they're entitled to do. But I'm not sure sometimes they are entitled to do. Well, um, thanks for that, Keith. Uh, it is very difficult, isn't it, um, for us to be able to um, really take an awful lot of action on that, it seems to me, because people are interpreting what they're allowed to do in rather different ways. And um, I think that that's been the, that has been one of the uh, problems about the, 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 the COVID lockdowns all along. And mm -hmm. we've had an awful lot of people coming into the county when they probably shouldn't have been coming into the county. And there's not a lot we can do to stop them. We don't have enough of a, of a police force. Um, we certainly can't expect our rights of way team to, to fling themselves under the hooves of galloping horses. So um, I would just like to echo uh, the thanks of the committee to uh, uh, Shona and to Pete um, for the sterling work that you're de doing. I am concerned about the situation um, about uh, the inability to, to reinvest income which you've made yourselves back into your own service and I will be thinking about how, uh, how this can be taken up. So um, many thanks to you for that. Um, Daniel, are, are there any recommendations arising or are we just, are we just accepting this? Um, no, Chair, there are no specific recommendations unless the committee have anything that they wanted to, uh, you know, to recommend arising from their discussion just now. Um, do, does anybody want specifically to uh, to make any recommendations, please? Well, Chairman, it wouldn't be a bad idea, would it not, to put forward as a recommendation that the monies they do make over and above, that they, they're uh, allowed to keep and spend within and the And reinvest. Yep. Yes. OK. Um, do yes. I have support for that? I'd be happy to second that. No. Sorry, was that was that Keith or, or, or uh, Ted? That Ted. was Ted. Right, yeah. thank you. So that's that's proposed by Le, uh, Councillor Les Winwood, seconded by Councillor Ted Clark. Um, is everybody else happy with that? Otherwise, would you please show in, in the chat function, please? No, everybody happy with that? OK, can we put sure. that down as a recommendation, Daniel, or are we going against all the rules? Uh, no, sure, you can recommend anything you wish, so I will note that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rather and I think, I think it, this should be taken uh, up the line, quite honestly. OK, thank you very much indeed for your attendance. Now we're moving on to the um, uh, next item, which is the update on provision of burial space, cemetery extension and service related developments. Do we have anybody from the from the um, um, from that service with us? Have we got Mark Foxall? Good afternoon, anybody? Yeah, good afternoon, Chair. It's Mark Foxall. Can, can oh, you see hello, Mark. Great. Can, yeah. can you see Sorry, him? Sorry, you, okay. you didn't come up in my in my uh, line of, uh, of speakers. Um, uh, welcome, Mark. Um, very nice to, to welcome you. Would you like to speak to your report? Yeah. Good afternoon, Chair and uh, members of the committee. Um, I've got for the committee uh, a report and two appendices on, on bereavement services. Um, hopefully members of the committee have access and sight of these. Um, my report updates since I last met with you in, in February 2019, which is nearly two years ago and that time has flown by, hasn't it? Mm. Um, I wish to update in the sort of following areas, um, a bit on Longdon Road Cemetery, 
uh, provision of Muslim burial space, uh, Minster Dean Church Paul Back Cemeteries, the Infant Ashes Memorial, and a bit about future cemetery provision in Shrewsbury and um, countywide sort of collaboration and, and burial provision. And also, you know, it's obviously, it's topical, um, the environmental impacts of the service as well. I Thank have, you. I have uh, a recommendation and it's for the committee to um, consider the progress made and identify any future course of action or work programme required. And um, I'm happy to answer questions and receive comments at the end. Fine. So briefly on the opportunities and risk, um, the service is statutory. Um, Shropshire Council is the cremation and the burial authority for the county. Um, the services are in constant and increasing demand. Um, the main risk factor for the service is um, the finite and diminishing burial space serving particularly Shrewsbury and uh, it's proving a significant challenge in finding a new site, um, particularly with the right environmental credentials, but also hampering this search. Um, I'm sort of running out of options within the council's estate, so I'm having to look to the sort of open market to a degree. And of course, the rising value of land around the town that has hope value for residential development. So th those are the twin sort of challenges really for finding a new site. And mm. um, briefly on the financial assessment, um, we make a good surplus from bereavement services, uh, principally from ground rent from the crematorium, but also uh, a good proportion from uh, burial fee income. So where uh, residents, uh, you know, their their uh, loved ones are buried in, in Shropshire Council cemeteries. We retain those burial fees. Um, but the, the the bigger program is, you know, uh, acquisition of, of possible land for a new cemetery, uh, and also its development. And that'll be, you know, significant capital um, expenditure, and that'll need to come from a uh, capital program rather than service budget. Yep. Uh, naturally, uh, a new cemetery would make and generate uh, new incomes um, from, from those burial fees. But of course, with that comes additional costs in terms of, of maintaining a new cemetery. So we can't switch off the maintenance at our current cemeteries and we'll have an, an additional one where we need to maintain it and, and, and um, prepare those graves. Um, item five into my report. Um, development of new areas of, of burial within Longdon Road Cemetery. If members can see the Appendix 1, um, burials have commenced in the in the pink areas, which if you recall, I, I removed some trees and some floral borders from those areas to, to free up that space. Um, I know that there was concern at the time. I, I showed a photo that um, was in the early stage of a, a double depth grave being dug and, and one or two members said, well, that's nowhere near double depth. And, and, and I think that was right. But members, I can please assure you that uh, um, double depth burials have taken place in that area, in those areas, and, and they've been uh, they've been fine. Um, there's been 37 new grave spaces dug uh, in Longdon Road in the last Full calendar year. So this is these are new graves in, in new areas, and of course on top of that we have uh, what we call reopens, where you know typically the spouse would be would be buried uh, behind you know behind the, the the first one that passed away. So 37 new grave spaces in Longdon Road, and that's typical sort of annual demand. So that's you know 37, 35, 33 of the sort of figures over the last sort of two or three years. Um, in March of last year, um, taking the opportunity of the first lockdown when the when the cemetery was um, principally closed or restricted opening to the public, we allowed the public in to attend uh, funerals, but we, we tried to deter the public from just taking their general exercise through the cemetery. But while it was much, much less frequently visited, um, in actual fact, I, I, I utilise the um, Pete, Pete Banford's outdoor partnership team to remove what's known as a berm of soil from the area which is shown blue on the appendix. 
and it, it was a sort of triangular length of soil, sort of like a Toblerone in in, pro, in profile. Um, and having that there, it, it, it hindered access to maintain the trees that form the boundary in that area. And it also looked a bit unsightly. So I've, I've removed that or, or outdoor partnerships removed that on my behalf uh, very quickly during the first lockdown uh, period. And that's created um, further space that I think we can use for burial. And, you know, a, a quick sort of desktop analysis suggests that that will provide uh, a further 100 graves, um, which um, it, it optimises the, the use of the land and extends the life of the cemetery. Um, importantly, it buys time in which to identify a new cemetery site. As uh, say 100 graves would last, you know, about three years. Um, and of course, it, um, it generates uh, additional revenue from this site. Um, a grave sells for in the region of, of fifteen hundred pound for the for the first purchaser who buys the exclusive right of burial in there. Um, we can have a second burial, and we can accommodate up to eight sets of ashes in in a single grave. So, depending on the sort of extent of the family and what they take up, each grave can generate between fifteen hundred pound and sort of three thousand pound. So that's a you know to every additional space that I can find. Um, I'm, you know, keenly looking for and, and, and look to bring online. There are a few other areas around the cemetery where some further landscaping changes would, would yield some further spaces, but I'm, I'm obviously looking for the, the easiest opportunities first and, and where there are other areas that can be developed, they may come at a greater cost to, to bring them online. Um, Moving on to um, burial space for the, the Muslim faith community. Uh, this is shown a little bit more on, on Appendix 2. Um, the committee will be very aware that for uh, many years, um, Shropshire's Muslim community has been petitioning for uh, dedicated burial space to meet their faith requirements. And principally, this is about the sort of orientation of the graves. Um, Previously, the community have had to travel out of county. They've been utilising um, uh, cemeteries in Telford and, and further afield. But of course, when they do this, they have to pay non-residential premiums. Um, so there's been a strong demand for provision, um, particularly in South Shropshire, although there's been a lack of provision um, throughout Shropshire. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say that um, with the first to be able to provide that within you know, the sort of ceremonial county of Shropshire. Um, a recent inquiry came via Councillor Roberts and um, I entered into discussion and uh, liaison with the local um, sort of Bangladeshi Muslim community. Um, we held a, a series of meetings and discussions on site and um, I've been able to make arrangements for um, 41 graves um, orientated as, as required, and, and these are in extension 30 of the of the cemetery. Um, and this has um, just helped address this long-standing need, and they're very, very pleased and grateful for that uh, for that progress being made. In addition to those 41, or a further 18 to be orientated uh, conventionally, and, um, and and all of the graves. Um, within the cemetery are now being sold at the point of need. So it's not a case of any graves being reserved um, and there's an understanding that um, other faiths or those of no faith might also need to be buried in, in this section uh, depending on, on the availability of space and, and the pressure that the service is under. Uh, and everyone's clear of that sort of um, understanding. Um, Mention about the developments at uh, Minsterley and Church Pulverbatch. Um, in, in recent weeks, the authority has completed on the on the legal transfer to the authority of a parcel of land adjoining the existing Minsterley Cemetery. And I, I should like to record on behalf of Shropshire Council, uh, grateful thanks to, to Mrs Sutherland, uh, the benefactor who's gifted the land to the council. So it comes with a few conditions. Um, uh, Mrs Sutherland's late husband is already, his ashes are interred within that site. 
and they want to reserve one or two other plots for for their own and, and, and family use and, fr and friends use um, and they like to see uh, a number of trees being planted on on, on the site but um, in in summary it, it, it's great to have finally secured that uh, land uh, and have something which we can work on for Minsterly because space there was particularly running out. Um, I'll need to assess the characteristics of the site and, and suitability for burials, and, and this will take time to establish. It requires um, the installation of boreholes to, to uh, measure and monitor groundwater levels, um, and that monitoring can take sort of 12 or 15 months to, to complete. What I'd like to do in, in the very short term is to um, remove and replant some parts of hedge line in the old cemetery. The reason for doing this is because um, by removing that uh, sort of short length of hedge, it will mean that the existing cemetery for which planning consent is already in place, I can get another row hopefully of graves in there and that just helps meet this sort of pinch point and this immediate need while we look to develop the rest of the new part of the cemetery. Um, talking about Church Pulverbatch, um, further works have been done there to uh, secure the boundary and install some uh, piping to improve the drainage of that land. Um, the, the work required there is sort of secondary importance now that we've secured the land at, at, at Minster Lee, um, but I'll be progressing with uh, works there when when conditions and, and the time is right. Um, moving on to the installation of the Infant Ashes Memorial. Um, it was installed in the Cloister Garden at Longdon Road Cemetery in, in October of, of last year. Um, it's been a very trying and challenging time for the parents uh, and I'm incredibly pleased to have achieved this outcome for them. Um, it provides parents where they can go and visit and, and pay their respects, uh, grieve and reflect where previously uh, without having the ashes and having a final resting place, they've, they've had nowhere to uh, sort of release those emotions. So it's a, it's a very good, a very good outcome. Um, that location and design of memorial, it, it wasn't favoured by everyone and I'm keen to progress with a a further memorial, ideally in the quarry in the Dingle, um, if it's possible to work with the uh, appropriate authority uh, that um, have occupation of that site. Um, future cemetery provision. Um, as I've mentioned, progress has been made at Longdon Road, Church Paul Verbatch and Minster Lee. Um, but also there's unused space that exists at, at Emstry Cemetery. There are currently restrictions limiting the use of this space and principally this is to do again with um, groundwater conditions. But the occupier Dignity have installed um, some boreholes of their own um, in, in, in that site. They've been gathering data. They're aware of some sort of um, um, actions they can take to to mitigate concerns that the Environment Agency might have and they are keen to explore with the Environment Agency and, and Shropshire Council whether further use of that cemetery can be made for what I term full coffin burials. So it's a little bit unknown at this stage. They're building a case with the data that they're gathering and I've been asked to arrange a, a tripartite meeting with the EA, Shropshire Council and Dignity and um, I'll keep committee updated with the progress on that. Of course, if it if it can come, come to fruition that we can use that space, that would be a great outcome. Um, the authority wouldn't receive the burial fees from that site, but it, it would help uh, meet this immediate sort of uh, future need. Um, I continue to search around Shrewsbury to identify a new cemetery site um, anyway 
um, because you know mid to long term we need we need a new cemetery. I've near exhausted the uh, sites that are that are already within uh, the council's own estate. I've looked at one um, north of Copthorne area, and I've looked at one uh, east in the sort of Hormond area. Neither of those pros neither of those sites show great um, prospect. Um, so it, it may be that um, a new site a new site might have to be acquired. The primary concern is to ensure that we uh, acquire a site with the right the right environmental credentials. Um, just touch on the county wide barrier provision and um, collaboration during the pandemic. Um, members asked me to sort of undertake some surveying work with um, our town and parish council partners to look at what burial space they have in each of their sort of um, sort of jurisdiction. Um, I've done two rounds of that surveying now. Um, I've got a reasonable data set, but it's not complete because not all councils have responded. Um, but I continue to build a sort of a fuller picture of that as, as and when I can. Clearly what's come to light in, in, in undertaking that exercise is the, uh, the municipal provision is just one part of, of what's happening. So there's, a, there's an extensive um, uh, faith provision. So the Church of England principally, they have their own churchyards and, and uh, um, in, each, in each parish area. What, what's come to light is there's no sort of diocesan overview. Each church has a, an idea of what burial space they have, but that data is not collated upwards in any form presently. So there's nothing at a deanery level, there's nothing at a, at a diocese level which gives them uh, an indication of what, what burial space they have left. The, the Church of England is aware of, of this sort of lack of, of, of um, sort of collated uh, data. And I think it will make moves to try and um, undertake that work because it's a, you know, it's a fundamental source of their income. But at present, it's it's not been embarked upon. Um, and of course, there's also private provision. So we have one or two uh, green burial providers, uh, a couple in South Shropshire and one in North Shropshire. Um, and over the last 12 months, I've worked with uh, Bridge North Brosley and Highley to help with their proposals for future burial provision. So in the um, early weeks of the pandemic, I uh, initiated contact with partner councils, uh, the diocesan offices and various contractors. What I was trying to pull together was um, uh, uh, sort of a data set of, you know, which council is engaging which sort of freelance um, grave digger, what equipment they might have in terms of shoring and excavation equipment and try and pull this into a centralised resource because we're all doing our own thing in a very fragmented uh, way. Um, but of course, in times of pandemic, it can call for a call for a more of a sort of mutual aid type response. So I've, I've pulled together that sort of that data set and it's recorded with our emergency planning team. And, and the data I've pulled together is on our sort of Teams network where it can app, can be accessed. Um, I'm, I'm sure it would it, it calls for a, a greater combined and collective overview. Um, it's a critically small number of, of people and resources that are active in this sector. Uh, and of course, we're, we're large and rural, so those freelance grave diggers maybe you know have to dig one in in the south of the county and then one in the north of the county on the same day. Um, and, and the issue, of course, we've faced is that um, uh, everywhere in the county and beyond has experienced a, an increased demand, and this has been simultaneous. So we, you know, we can't we can't rely on you know sort of out of county help in in, in any way. Um, I'll touch on um, um, the environmental impact. Of course, it's been it's a, it's a topical issue. It's one that um, Adrian and, and Councillor Carroll have, have touched on a, a great deal early on in this um, meeting. Um, I'm, I'm keenly aware that uh, Bereavement Services has at present um, 75 acres or so of green space, uh, and that will grow with uh, if we acquire a new cemetery site. Um, uh, and as a committed environmentalist, I'm keenly aware of the impact 
the series can have both positively and negatively and um, seeking to address these issues where I can. Um, in, in recent months, I've worked with uh, a local tree planting group. They're keen to plant more trees at um, Long and Road Cemetery. And of course, with the Min Minster Lee extension, there'll be um, scope and a desire to see more trees planted there. Um, I've bought rechargeable battery powered tools for the volunteers that work at Longdon Road Cemetery. They're using um, sort of rechargeable battery strimmers and, and, and so on. Um, that's, um, that technology has come on in, in leaps and bounds in recent years. It is far preferable to using uh, sort of petrol powered tools. They're quiet and of course they're not reliant on um, on fossil fuels. Um, Longdon Road Cemetery, the old park, continues to be managed for the benefit um, of the wildlife there. It's a, a species rich grassland in the old cemetery because it's it's never been ploughed, it's never had um, fertilisers and, and, and it's had limited pesticide use. So there's good uh, sort of insect life and, and bird life and so on. We've put up bird boxes and bat boxes there. Um, at the moment, um, the people who visit the site use they're using uh, sort of potable tap water to, to water uh, dead flowers in the cemetery. So I'm quite keen to explore uh, using water butts there, which would be a much more sound and uh, uh, environmental use of the, of the water. Um, and currently we're importing topsoil because it's a better quality when we have to top up graves. So we dig out, when we excavate a grave, we, we excavate a, a volume of topsoil uh, and any gardeners know when you dig a hole, the soil never goes back into the same hole because it, it, it sort of becomes more voluminous as you dig it out. So I'm quite keen to look at how we can explore uh, screening the, the subsoil that we uh, remove from graves and use that um, as topsoil rather than importing soils to the site. Um, and all of these measures will, will hopefully um, combine to reduce the um, negative environmental impact of the service. So that's a, a quick um, walk through my report. Uh, in conclusion, um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, uh, bereavement services has at times been uh, under you know, increased pressure, significant pressure. Um, I should like to thank our partners at um, uh, Shrewsbury Town Council who, who provide the grave digging function and our partners at um, Dignity who provide the, the uh, cremation technicians. Both of those functions are very much behind the scenes during this pandemic, um, but very much on the front front line. And um, it, it's right that I extend my thanks to to their efforts during the pandemic. They've been um, incredibly dedicated and committed, uh, you know, working day in day out, say behind the scenes, um, but uh, providing uh, providing a critical function. Um, I should also like to say that uh, if members aren't aware. Uh, my role in bereavement services, I am the team uh, and currently I'm engaged as a, a 0 0.6 full time equivalent on the service and I, and I help out, help out elsewhere uh, in other service areas for the council. So I have a full time role, but only 0 0.6 uh, equivalent in, in bereavement services. But um, despite this, I think um, I'm very pleased with the, the good progress that's been made in the, in the service over the last 12 months. So that's me concluded um, and I'm happy to take your uh, questions and comments about the report. Thank you. Uh, Mark, thank you. That is an absolutely brilliant report. You have been so busy. You've done so much since we uh, si since we last met and and you told us about the work that you were doing there. I mean, for me, uh, some of the highlights are not only managing to get more burial space within Longdon Road, but also uh, finding um, uh, burial space for the Muslim faith community, community which I think is fantastic, um, and uh, and the way you are um, obviously moving outside uh, Shrewsbury and and um, you know uh, um, negotiating with Minster and Church Pulverbat, that's great, and it would be very good to see more of that. I'm just wondering what are the problems that you're coming up against um, in terms of um, of the parishes and getting information from the parishes. If it's just if it's that they just don't respond, would it help at all if um, if if something went out through Salk? 
uh, it has on your behalf. Yeah, it has uh, the, that Salk is the the sort of tool that I've used really to mm. get the first two surveys out, and uh, a number where where those parish councils have no provision, they they very quickly come back and sort of um, advise of that, and it helps to you know well you can eliminate them, then. From them. Where yeah. I where I struggle, I think, is where those parish councils perhaps haven't got a great a great grasp of exactly what they've got and what their demand is. I think it's, mm. I, I think that's where I encounter um, sort of slightly more difficulty. There are one or two town councils that um, haven't responded, and, and given the sort of you know slightly greater resource they have over the parish councils, it, you know it would be helpful. I think if they could um, dedicate a little bit of time time to it, mm. um, but uh, you know, I have used Salk and. It, Really, it, it, it comes down now where where I sort of engage in a conversation with them. If, if they're turning to me as a highly parish council has done to help with an issue there, where I sort of can build that rapport, it, it helps in getting a, a response. It, you know, there's no there's no shame in saying we don't know exactly what number of grave spaces we have, or or no exact idea of, of demand but if, if they can give a you know a broad a broad answer that's better than nothing at all yeah yeah and i quite see that um does anybody have questions for for mark please daniel can you uh, advise chair it's council keith robs i just asked to say a word yes uh, please do keith I have, I've asked, I've asked on the, on the system. So you have, I don't know why my chat function doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, well, I've asked on the chat system anyway. Mark, um, can I just explain uh, and say thank you for what you've done for the, for the Muslim community in, in the Shrewsbury area? I mean, you were brilliant. I mean, I, I just explained that the chairman of the Shrewsbury Muslims is a resident of mine, and he wrote to me asking for my advice and help. And I, I wrote, I sent some emails to Mark and Mark took it on board and we've, we've achieved it. Well done. Great. Good. But very very uh, welcome. Yeah, Thanks well, for that, Keith. Thank you for that. And the, the other thing is, we. I know it's difficult to say, but Shrewsbury is an expanding town as the county town. You've, you've found extra burial areas on Longdon Road, but that's... I think sorry, we've lost, lost you, I, I, I'm sorry, Keith. I, I fear we've lost you. I'll move on to Tina, and then we can come back to, to Keith. See if we pick him up again. Tina, Chair, Chair thank you. It, it, it's literally just a thank you. It was a really comprehensive report, and mm. obviously, I think there's some sterling work gone on here. So, just a big thank you. And we do understand the pressures, I believe, on the teams, and you know, just a big thank you at this time in particular. Thank you. Welcome. As I say, the, the team is, is is I at the moment. <laughs> well, um, uh, single handedly, you've done a fantastic job. Uh, Nick Hignett. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is turning into a series of thank yous, but as councillor for Ray Valley Ward, I just want to say a, a personal thank you. Uh, I've put mincely parish council meetings. A lot of the residents expressed lots of concern over the last uh, two or three years that I know of uh, about the, the risk of running out of burial space in Minsley and to have negotiated and achieved a result is excellent. Uh, thank you also, as a uh, previous speaker said, for a really comprehensive report uh, detailing everything that we needed to know and, and that shows in the fact that we don't have many questions to ask. You've explained everything, so thank you very much. Yes, th thank you, uh, Councillor Hignett. What I, what I will say is that, um, of course, when the planning consent for the current Minsley Cemetery was granted, there were much lower sort of environmental threshold for acceptance of a new site. Because this is a, an extension, I'm required to obtain a change of use planning consent. It will involve engaging with the Environment Agency. They will have to provide a view on, on what they think of, of that land. It's not a given that it will be successful. 
naturally we hope it will be, um, but only time will tell. That'll be determined by the, the monitoring that will need to take place and the site characteristic. I, you know, God willing, it'll be it'll be right to use and that will be fine. But we do have to go through that exercise. Understood. Thank you, Chair. Mark, just before we let you go, um, I just wanted to pick up with you that point you made about um, about um, um, the having to having to purchase more more burial space, um, and um, you know, in order to fulfil the long term burial capacity in Shrewsbury, and and whether you would expect to have to pay uh, the same price as you would if you were uh, by, uh, uh, as if housing was going on a site or uh, and also whether the whether the council has actually committed to 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 any funding to purchase land if it's needed obviously it depends on um sorry it's mark foxall i should have forgotten the, the protocol it's mark foxall bereavement services manager um it, it will depend uh, naturally on on where that site happens to be um if it, it, ideally we're looking for a, a site on the on the periphery of town uh, to make it accessible um to to the to the residents but I, I suppose it depends on on the characteristic of that site currently and and what the realistic prospect for principally residential development would be um with, with the the work that's happening with uh the northwest relief road um i've be, it's been brought to my attention that that if it proceeds it may um open up for um acquisition and development sites that previously had been ruled out so it, the, i'm i'm not pinning all my hope on that i've got one or two other sites to look at around the around the town um the main for, for me the main thing is the hardest part is to achieve the sort of environmental credentials. We've struggled with Emstry. Members will be aware that we've we encountered difficulties with the Mid and Oak site. And more importantly than the cost almost is choosing the right site with the right credentials. Yeah, understood. Sorry, what uh, was the second part of the question? Uh, well, it was just it was really um, whether whether there was funding available to to, to purchase um, from from the council, that is. Yes, it would it would not come from the bereavement services budget. Um, mm -hmm. There's a line mentioned in sort of um, the the capital programs um, uh, sort of project um, plan. And um, the the site that um, we developed at, at, along Mitten Oak Road. You know that was 25 or so uh, acres. So you know, if we if we look for a site of comparable size, it, you know, it could be, you know, a, a million pounds sort of um, price tag. You know, depending on on who owns it and what they foresee the um, uh, the future use of that land. But yes, it, it, it there's money. Well, it, certainly there's a there's a known need that the service will require a a new cemetery in the mid mid term and mark do you think this uh, th it would be appropriate for this to come out of the community infrastructure levy after all this is infrastructure isn't it in a, in a slightly funny way yes i, I think that's uh, a, a, you know a, a very um likely source for the mm. funding where where parish councils have um, been looking to extend or parish and town councils have looked to um, extend existing cemeteries. They have been turning to the the sill levies to to help fund that. Um, that's been a route being explored in in Bridge North, uh, and I think in Brosley as well. So I think it you know it is it is infrastructure. The larger yeah. the, the town and the villages grow, the more need there'll be for burial space. It's a, an appropriate use of that funding mechanism. Okay, thanks, Mark. Tina, sorry, did you want to come back? Tina?
No, she's disappeared. Um, Ted Clark. Yeah, Chairman, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I, I raised still as a way forward potentially. That was all in the chat line and you've raised it. So oh, no, I'm sorry, I, I stole it off you. I do apologise. Very impolite of me. Um, uh, Ted, you wanted a word. Uh, very briefly, thanks to, to Mark. He, he, he does a, a, a great deal of work. I was just querying, do we not do we not own the uh, remnants of the M Street site, which was um, an abandoned new cemetery under the in the old borough council days? Do we not still own that? Uh, yeah, Mark Fox, all bereavement services manager. Uh, yes, Ted, we, we do. Shropshire Council owns the crematorium and M Street Cemetery, but currently we lease it to Dignity. Um, that uh, lease arrangement was entered into in 2011 with co-op originally, but um, oh, yeah. Dignity now now acquire the acquired that lease and it runs to 2041. So they're the they're the occupier and leaseholder, and therefore it, it's it's their site to exploit the sort of business potential of it. Um, but they're keen to. Um, see what they can do there. Um, it would need sort of Shropshire Council's blessing as, as the landlord and the EA approval as well. Um, but if we can see that side come good, that would be very helpful to meet the midterm need. Yeah. Ch Chairman, if, if, yeah. Chair, if I may. So well, I, I understood that the lease to Dignity only extended as far as the crematorium itself. You're, you're saying that it extends the full length of the of the, the of the uh, old well, the old the aborted cemetery plot as well. That's all part of the lease with um, yeah. Dignity. Uh, yeah. Mark, Mark Foxall, bereavement services manager. Uh, yes, Ted, that's right. They they lease the entirety of that site. OK, Ted, you, you happy Mark. with that? Yes, thank you. Right. Chair, Chair it's Keith Roberts. Are you getting me now? Uh, sorry, I didn't see your name come up, uh, Keith. I can hear you now, yes. You, you, know, is you, it, you is went offline briefly. We've talk, yeah, we've talked a lot about a new cemetery for Shrewsbury. Can we make a recommendation that surely somebody should be furthering this quite urgently with the town building, you know, with all the new buildings and housing going on around the town? We do need some 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 effort put into it. I'm not, and I know you are, Mark, but but we need to recommend that it does need a new cemetery relatively urgently. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I think that's fair enough, uh, uh, Keith. Um, uh, Daniel, are you there? Yes, Chair, I am here. Can we can we uh, can we uh, um, put some words around that? Okay, then I will. Uh... I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll craft something in this, suggest something in the uh, work programme item agenda coming up shortly. OK. All right. Is, are, you, are you happy with that, Keith? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, let's All have right. it in writing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that, that's good. Thanks a lot. Um, we must let you go, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, th th this was a very impressive report and the amount of work that you've managed to cram in is quite, uh, quite astonishing. Thank you so much for coming back to us. And please, um, if there's anything else that you want to come and report to us about, we are always happy to see you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the comments and, and the kind words. And, um, you know, likewise, if there's anything that, that comes up, then, um, then then please do get in touch. Lovely. OK, thank you, thank you so Bye. much. Thanks. Right, um, committee, I do apologise. We've gone slightly um, off piece and over, and, and over the top in terms of timing here. But I'm afraid we've got one more item on the agenda and then we've got the work programme to whiz through, um, which is the affordable housing allocation policy and scheme. Daniel, do you want to take this? Hello, Chair. Yes, Daniel Webb here, overview and scrutiny officer. Very quick uh, background for the audience, really. Uh, back in October, the committee had a look at uh, home point just as a sort of reassurance really and, and sort of respond to sort of the day-to-day -day concerns that you have as, as elected members in using home point um, 
all fine and well, but what we did, uh, what was asked at the meeting by the housing service manager was that you would uh, participate in um, working with her to update the uh, allocations policy that underpins Home Point's work, which you uh, eagerly agreed to do. So uh, we held a meeting in December with uh, some of the members of the committee who formed a one-off working group. Uh, who spent uh, a couple of hours with the housing services manager going through the various parts of the allocations policy through its bandings and through some of its rules around uh, people who lived out of the county, uh, armed services, armed forces, sorry, uh, people requiring more than one bedroom. Uh, your, your work was augmented by a questionnaire that went out to the all of the elected members in the council asking uh, for them to reply with some of their concerns around the allocations policy uh, and, and about 40 of them very kindly did respond so so we took the allocations policy itself and some of those concerns and we worked our way through them uh, and we created a suggested uh, a set of suggestions uh, to give back to the housing services manager. So the report in front of you lists uh, those suggestions. Um, and one thing to note really was a lot of these were done without any real background research from the committee. So it, it's very much the case that, that, that these that these are, are suggestions rather than recommendations because they aren't really backed up with huge evidence other than our experience tells us or um, you know, it would be a good idea to do this. So we, we've forwarded them on to the housing services manager who will take them and, and use them as part of her work to, to, to redevelop the allocations policy. And um, the plan will then be to bring this back to, to the committee at some point in the future for us to have a further look at it before it goes on for final approval. So I'll leave the report with you and uh, welcome any suggestions. Any suggestions from anyone? Um, this was a fairly intensive afternoon that we spent on this on this piece of work. Um, but if if there's anything that occurs to you uh, uh, at this moment, then please please say so. Brilliant. Okay, um, I was quite keen that that when the finished article had been or the, or, or the finished uh, allocations policy had been written up that it should actually go to cabinet because I think this is important. Um, I think that this is um, this is something which affects a lot of people and which has has attracted a lot of comment and some complaints. And so um, the fact that we have revised it um, I think means that it should go up the line to the cabinet for to, to have a look at and approve. Is everybody happy with that? Anybody unhappy? Okay, I, I, I will take that as, as an okay from you. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, right, we come now to the work programme. And then you can all go home. At least you are at home, but. <laughs> That's me again, Chair. Hello again, Daniel yes. Webb, uh, yeah. Overview and Screwing Officer here again. Um, the uh, elections loom 5th of May, 6th of May, uh, and because of that, obviously, we face ourselves in a situation where come July, we might have entirely new councillors, administration leaders, chairs, committees, everything's all up for grabs really. So yep. um, so at the moment the work programme only forwards to uh, before the election, which means they only forwards to one future meeting. So the question really is what should we do with our next meeting? At the moment there are three items on the agenda. Uh, there is one on public transport funding to receive an update from uh, officers here around their work to reconfigure public transport, an ongoing piece of work in the light of well, rapid changes really in how we move about the county. Um, a a long-standing uh, piece to bring the ongoing library strategy to uh, the committee uh, mm -hmm. and also as well uh, a draft of the rural strategy. Um, yeah. What I would also know as well from the discussion today is that there are uh, as a recommendation that we we write to cabinet. Well, to say two things to cabinet, really. Um, 
a, a recommendation that uh, cabinet explore public rights of way keeping the income they generate within their service um, and uh, an urgent recommendation to consider the expansion of burial space in Shrewsbury along with forwarding this allocations policy so that would suggest as well a piece of work uh, in between this that we write a brief report to uh, cabinets for their regular slot which we never use um, or very rarely use uh, to sort of essentially to give an outline of the work that we've done recently to take the allocations policy through and to make these additional recommendations so if that's something that the committee are, are happy for me to do then we'll do that uh, and then report back to your March meeting on that good okay so everybody happy uh, I do believe Tim uh, Ted has uh, asked to speak um, and I think Tina has as well chair right Ted Thank you, Chair. My, my, my um, one concern is I much miss not having the facility to actually study the reports or reference the reports whilst we go through the meeting. I do feel yeah. that uh, the, the virtual arrangement is very much lacking, really, in that respect. We're, we're, we're driving blind, aren't we? Or on our memory of what 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 what. Um, we believe the report said, particularly on, on a heavy day like today, it's a great pity we haven't got the the facility to actually access the the the, the reports as as they're being presented. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much. You've done very well. Some of us are so fortunate to be able to read them off their phones or or iPad, but I do take your point, uh, Ted. It is difficult particularly when there are a lot of reports as we've been going through today. It's all been quite um, quite intensive. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's un very unlikely that anything will be done about that until after the next election, when I think we need to uh, we need to make some representations about it. I can't see anything happening much before, regrettably. Uh, but I, should, I think it's a, it's a perfectly fair point, actually. Uh, Councillor Woodward has a question as well, Chair. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tina. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Woodward. Yeah, I, I think we should use the cabinet slot to, to move this through because I think it needs highlighting. I really do. What do you mean? Uh, sorry, Tina, can I just be clear that, that you think this business about not, not being able to uh, study the report as we're going through, uh, as, as we're on teams, is, no. is, that, is that what you mean? No, Chairman, as Daniel was saying, there's a slot available to us to actually put through the information that we wish to Cabinet. Yes, the, you know, and sorry. I, and I, sorry. Sorry. No, I think I think obviously Ted has made a valid point and it is yeah. difficult. Luckily, yeah. I can work off an iPad alongside me, which is my yeah. husband's iPad, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. we can work yeah. that way. Yeah. But, yeah. but I, I, funnily enough, I do think that that's something that needs to be taken into consideration in the next um, iteration of this Council. Um, but that's a battle to be fought later on, I think. OK, I think we've finally reached the end of this uh, long, but interesting, I hope you find, um, uh, meeting. And I would like to thank you all very much for your attendance and for your questions. And the next meeting, hopefully, we won't be quite so late. Oh, sorry, that was my dog. Um, the next meeting is the 15th of March um, at two o'clock. So I, we will look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you, Celia, for a very good meeting. Thank you, Viv, very much. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank well, you. thanks for